All right, welcome to our virtual aviation safety stand down. The event is produced by Bright Spot Schools. I'm Gene Benson, and I will be your host today. We want to say thank you to our sponsors for their contribution to aviation safety uh, and for their support of this event. In alphabetical, they are Aircraft Specialty Services and their product CamGuard, Avemco Insurance, Avia Flight Academy, Bright Spot Schools, Mid Island Air Service, and New York Jet. Patient Airlift Services, or PALS, Pilot2Pilot.com, Society of Aviation and Flight Educators, or SAFE, and the Westchester Aviation Association. We thank all of you. Uh, we also want to acknowledge our presenters. We have a terrific group of professionals from a variety of specialties. I'll introduce each presenter before their respective presentations. They've all graciously given their time today in support of aviation safety. First up this morning is David St. George. David's a well-known presenter at many safety events around the U.S. You may have seen him at Sun of Fun. You may have seen him at Oshkosh. He gets around. He presently serves as executive director of the uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> Society of Aviation and Flight Educators. It's easier just to say safe, isn't it? Uh, David is also a designated pilot examiner and a corporate pilot. His presentation today is titled, Safety is in Your Hands. And with that, I'm going to turn the presentation over to David. <coughs> David, you have the controls. All righty. You hearing me okay? We're hearing you fine. Okay. I'm going to kill my webcam. And uh, thank you all for joining us today. And I know you got a messy little screen here until I launch the uh, PowerPoint. But I want to thank you all for coming, and uh, it's been sort of a mixed blessing with COVID, but it means that we get online a lot more, we see a lot more of you. I would encourage you to take notes. I would encourage you to use the chat, because as I'm talking, Gene is going to be monitoring that for questions, which we'll take at the end of the show. Yeah, not, We're trying not the chat, David, excuse me, not the chat, the Q&A, uh, Q the, the questions, the Q&A. Excellent, okay. Uh, yeah, I'm a Zoom guy, so go to webinar. I'm you know, not exactly sure what we're going to be seeing. Anyway, thank you for joining, and thank you for being part of the WINGS program. Um, you probably don't know, WINGS is about to get a huge upgrade, and uh, we've been meeting regularly, and Salesforce is writing the new web interface, so it will be responsive. It will be actually fun. It won't be a government product, so that's coming soon. Uh, so let's see if we can get this... Uh, PowerPoint launched. Let's see. That should be full screen. Um, anyway, um, let's back up to where we should be. There's the title. <laughs> Safety is in your hands if. So this is not a yank and bank seminar. This is not how to be safer by controlling your plane better or expanding your envelope. This is how to be safe by thinking better, and it means that you can immediately put this to use as a pilot. Okay, I just got something in my earpiece. I guess yeah. that means... That was... Um, I needed to click something else there, David, so uh, we just <laughs> kind of went live. Can I interrupt you for just a second here and yes, uh, back a little bit? Uh, I'm sorry about that. It was a mess up on my part. Um, I just want to welcome everybody here. One second. And uh, <laughs> I apologize for that. We had a little screw up there. Welcome to our virtual aviation safety stand down. The event is produced by uh, Bright Spot Schools. I'm Gene Benson. I'll be your host today. I need to, I don't need to tell you where the exits are. Like in a regular seminar, our emergency would be a system crash. And if that happens, check your email. We'll figure something out. We want to say thank you to our sponsors for their contribution to aviation safety for their support of this event. In alphabetical order, they are Aircraft Specialty Services and their product CamGuard, Avemco Insurance, Avia Flight Academy, Bright Spot Schools, Mid-Island Air Service, and New York Jet. Patient Airlift Services are PALS, Pilot2Pilot.com, Society of Aviation and Flight Educators, which is SAFE, and the Westchester Aviation Association. We also want to say thanks and acknowledge our presenters. We have a great group of professionals today from a variety of specialties. I'll introduce uh, each presenter before their uh, respective presentations, and uh, they've all graciously uh, uh, agreed to give their time in support of aviation safety. As for WINGS credit, um, 
to those of you who requested it during the registration process. Uh, to be eligible, you must be logged in for most of the session, participate in most of the polls. Your poll response does not matter. It just proves that you are participating and not just logged in. Sorting the data and issuing the credit, a little bit time consuming, so please give me a week to get that accomplished. Okay, now we're caught up. Uh, first up is David St. George. David's a well-known presenter at many safety events around the U.S. He presently serves as the executive director of SAFE, and David is also a designated pilot examiner as well as a corporate pilot. His presentation today is titled, Safety is in Your Hands. So, okay, uh, uh, David, Take it I think off. you can okay. now begin. Yeah, sorry about that. So we click that little slate and uh, my smiling face comes up. I'll leave the video up just for a second here and say hi to all of you. Thank you for attending. Thank you all for being part of the uh, WINGS safety program. I can't tell you how, that, how important that is to your safety, and you do get credit, as Gene said. The program is undergoing an overhaul, and you should see a facelift this fall. The uh, committees have been meeting, and uh, Salesforce is going to write a new responsive website, so we're going to get rid of that creaky old website which, quite frankly, they're afraid to fix because it might crash. So sometime, I think, in October, we're expecting that. And I think Ben Strzok from the, uh, the SPM from Farmingdale, the uh, safety program manager from the FAA, is going to talk more about that. Anyway, I would encourage you to participate in the question and answer part of this because Gene will be monitoring that. I will be talking. We've got short, little presentations. So I know all the presenters have been yanking slides out and trying to make this conform to the TED Talk 20-minute, 30-minute sort of format. So the title here, Safety is in Your Hands, I am talking today not about the usual things I talk about, which is yank and bank and how to maneuver and use the full envelope and hands and models. I'm talking more about cognitive things, about making decisions. If you change the way you think about flying, you can be safer immediately. Costs no money, don't have to burn any av gas. You make better decisions, you will be a safer pilot. Um, so as Gene said, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm executive director of SAFE, and there is an email there. You can send me a note at any point, and uh, onward. This is the toolkit I wrote. I'm an Apple developer, and this uh, app is on the website. Um, it was originally designed for CFIs. The uh, toolkit is now for pilots also, and I added a new part called Check Ride Ready, because as a DPE, I see a lot of people who are unsuccessful in the check ride, and it's largely because they just didn't get the memo on what are the important parts. So check that out. Just go to SavvyCFI.com. So anyway, if uh, you guys fly glass planes with big electronic panels, you might not know what that is, but that's my 7AC Champ, and that's what I started flying 50 years ago, and that's what I still have, uh, an amazing plane. And uh, aviation is a wonderful pursuit. It's very diverse, um, but every part of it is going to require you to make decisions. Let me turn this off, get you on to the full screen. That should come up full screen. Um, I fly this on skis, I fly this on floats. Um, you, are, though, um, are part of a very unique group. You're less than 1% of the population, and to fly safety, every time you fly, you're making hundreds of decisions, and we're going to talk about how that happens. <coughs> Let's see. This is what I did for uh, 25 years. I ran a flight school, a 141 flight school with two college programs approved by the state of New York. Um, I learned, I watched people fly and grow as pilots. It was kind of like a little psychological laboratory to see how people really develop and make decisions. And ultimately I left that and I went back to grad school in psychology because I had determined that the most important airspace, as we say, is between the ears. Um, if you want to be safe as a pilot, you really have to be thinking correctly. And that's the if in the title. If you can think correctly and make good decisions, you can be safer tomorrow. We're going to be talking about <clears throat> what we call in aviation safety the slow motion um, accidents. These are where a series of decisions leads you to an unfortunate outcome in what we call breaking the chain. Um, at any point, if we can make a different decision, we will change the outcome. 
And I'm sure, like me, you read a lot of accident reports. And as you read them, you say, what were they thinking? And in fact, they probably weren't thinking. They were so involved in the situation, and um, they were not making good decisions. So we're going to talk about some tools that you can use to optimize your performance. And that's what I did at Penn. The psychological program was not about disabilities and uh, psychosis. It was about optimizing human performance. So after I uh, did that, I uh, flew corporate, and that's what I do now. I got into a Pilatus first, and uh, one of our speakers here, Toby Bukchescu, is going to talk about flying in the New York City airspace, and it's a wonderful uh, tonic after you've been a CFI for a bunch of years. So suddenly you're in the flow, you're making a lot of decisions daily, and then I got into a citation, which I fly now, which uh, is... Uh, what I have to do later today. But ultimately, the um, real focus today is why is personal flying so much less safe than business flying, instructional flying, and we all know airlines, just about a zero accident rate. How does that happen? How do they achieve that level of safety um, when the rest of us have problems? Now, we know that many more freedoms are available to a GA flyer. We can fly into any airport. We fly a very diverse set of machines, but we also fly as a team. I do not fly a jet. We fly the jet as a team. There's always two of us up front, and we're always bouncing decisions off of each other. A single person is not making that decision. We have a safety team working behind us. And so I have a dis director of operations that dispatches the flight. They track us. They know exactly when we're on the ground. We have to send a weight and balance to them before we even engage in the flight. So if we involve many of these tools in GA flying, I think we can be a lot safer without constricting our freedoms. So this is the usual format for when we approach a uh, safety seminar as a presenter. Um, Part of it is the um, people like yourselves, part of the safety program, who are very concerned about safety. And part of the people are what I call uh, instant gratification people. For them, aviation is more of a thrill ride than a, um, you know, a, a reasonable, rational kind of thing. And we're not going to really deal with that kind of people because they're not here today. And my problem for years was this guy. When I was teaching at a flight school, Top Gun came out, and I can't tell you um, what a negative, very public negative role model this was for my pilots. And now we have YouTube. You know, now we have this whole series of things that are creating problems with my student pilots. They'll say things like, can we fly the 152s in formation? And I'm going, where did that come from? But we all know that everyone is subject to huge influences, which are somewhat negative for safety. Uh, this is, and I don't know if this is going to play. I'm going to give it a click, and we'll see. But this is what you might find on YouTube. This is a kit box up in Idaho. Um, dubious level of certification and mechanical uh, wonderfulness. And that was what happened. He had a uh, vapor lock on takeoff. The engine stopped. And we're back on the sandbar. And I'm not going to go much further with that because we don't have a lot of time. But these are the kind of things that are attracting a lot of eyeballs in, uh, on the Internet. And they're getting a fantastic uh, level of activity. But unfortunately, people are seeing this and they're thinking that's what aviation is involved. Um, you know, and they come to us, and that's what they're looking for in aviation. So it's it's a real challenge for safety. But it really is, you know, kind of the inner child, um, the thrill ride, bonding up with that very, you know, anyone that's a parent you know, remembers the children look at me. You put that together, and you get YouTube. There's very positive things on YouTube. There's a lot of really good channels, but there's a lot of crap out there. And as an educator, I'm always fighting with the crap part. But this is typical of what we're starting to see. Here's a pilot who, and Gene uh, Benson is always watching accidents. He reads every one of them. But when I saw this one, I said, this is unique. 
the guy actually owned a Mooney as a student pilot. He was flying at night in mountainous areas in the Bay Area, and the outcome was just, you know, pretty predictable. So I'd point you at this guy, Dr. Bill Rhodes, if you want to see what scares CFIs in the middle of the night. He has a, uh, on LinkedIn, a slide share, and it's just sort of the cast of characters that drive us nuts. But we're going to take that guy off the uh, table. We're going to talk about the rational decision maker. Because when I give these seminars, I look out in the audience and I say, well, that guy's not crazy. He's trying really hard to be safe. And so um, the question is, how can a pilot who is really working diligently, part of the safety program, still have problems, still have accidents. And we're not talking about the inner child. We're not talking about the YouTube crazy. We're talking about the very rational, careful person. And so the answer to that question might be, uh, what do we call rational? And are we indeed really rational when we make decisions as pilots? So we're going to take a little tour of the human mind, um, as I did when I went back to school at Penn for psychology. Because as we look into this, and you know, the common modern media, you'll see more and more of this, and I'll point out you know, that PBS even has a special called Hacking the Mind. We live a lot on autopilot. We do a lot of things automatically. Uh, and uh, if you think pilots are rational, I just pulled this off the internet this morning. I mean, we're all part of this 12-step program. We're addicted to aviation. We're committed to it. But it's not always the most mm, uh, sensible thing to do. So I point you at this book if you haven't read it. Um, and I don't know if people read books anymore. But he also has a podcast, which is very good, Hidden Brain. Um, and this also is excellent. This is currently on PBS. It's available on uh, Amazon Prime. And Hacking the Mind kind of deals with that. And if this clip works, The audio is not coming through on your clip, David. So this is just starting to come into public awareness. But, you know, I was talking to Toby before. Toby's the controller that you're going to have on later today, and we were talking about how many multitask jobs he does. He'll be typing one thing into the computer while he's doing something else, while he's talking to a pilot on frequency. The brain is just an amazing tool if it's used correctly. But a lot of times, we all know this, we tend to op operate on autopilot. So um, the guy who started this uh, examination was Herbert Simon way back in the 50s won several prizes, one being a Nobel, but he was the first one to say that, no, people do not make decisions as rational people. Uh, they make decisions based on emotions. They make decisions make, based on biases. And Gene Benson and myself, when we give talks, we often almost give the same talk unless we're careful because we know that the human mind misused is going to lead us into problems. So check this guy out if you have a chance. But he came up with the word satisficing. And that means that instead of seeking the best situation uh, in every circumstance, we're kind of optimizing. The human goes through life optimizing situations, getting what works, and moves forward. We don't always look for the best answer, and we don't always conform to a standard. So to be safe, and what I found in corporate flying, what people will tell you about airline flying, is we conform to what we call standard operating procedures. So it's essential, if you want to be safe, to develop your own set of standard operating procedures to set rules that you won't go by. So moving forward, and this is the optimizing and the satisficing. There was a book recently published, uh, I guess it's five years now, called Thinking Fast and Slow. And it got a lot of play. I think it was a national book winner. And it won Daniel Kahneman a Nobel Prize as a behavioral 
economist. And what he posited was that we operate most typically on an automatic circuit called System 1. And we all do this. We drive home. We don't even remember the trip. We can type very quickly, but we can't tell you where the keys are on the keyboard. We operate in an automatic mode probably 90% of the time. That's System 1. System 2 is the thoughtful, reflective, intentional mind that takes over when the autopilot hits a snag. Kid runs into the road. Bingo. You know, we react and then we say, oh my gosh, and we go back to a level of awareness, intentionality. That's uncommon though. We unfortunately spend most of our time running on scripts. Um, and if you don't know what this is, just take a look and you'll figure it out. And I'm watching the clock. I don't have a lot of time. But that is basically the auto-driving Tesla car. And that's only one of about six cameras processing information. Your mind is doing this all the time when you're driving. Toby is doing this when he's typing and talking. Our brain is just an amazing tool. And uh, basically inside your cranium, you have not one brain, but four. You have the reptilian, which is doing your breathing, your heartbeat. You're not thinking about that digestion. You have your limbic, which is the emotional reaction. Ace uh, Rowley is on board today, and later he's going to talk about the startle response. That all happens in that limbic system. When that activates, your brain goes to the size of that little small yellow part, and that's all that works. There's no prefrontal cortex, no cortex, no higher level functions. We're just totally in the startle mode. If we're thinking, we're up here in the cortex, and that's the rational, reasonable thinking part. The prefrontal cortex is the high-level awareness and judgment part, and that doesn't even get fully um, developed until the age of 26. And I point out in all my seminars, you know, that explains adolescence. That explains why they recruit you into the military when you're in your teens. Um, lean green killing machine, you're, you don't even have judgment at the age of 18. Uh, not until you're about 26 do you develop that part of the brain. So we spend most of our time with the busy buzzing brain running scripts. And, you know, it's not a, a reach to say, you know, we are like a lot of animals on this planet. Uh, consumption, status, and reproduction. If you take those three items and you look at our modern culture, and you look at advertising and everything else, that's what our life consists of to a large degree, and it's very unfortunate. But there are capabilities in the brain that are amazing, like this guy here, you know, and you've seen these demonstrations. A grandmaster can look at a chessboard and in five seconds memorize it because they've done so much work with it. So there's an amazing capability, but we have to use it correctly. And what I tell my students is, you know, when you go to the internet and you watch the YouTubes and you forage around, it's very much like a food buffet where half of the items on the buffet are very nourishing and half of the items on the buffet are poisonous. So you don't know what you're getting. And if you're not careful, you're going to poison your brain with incorrect information. So anyway, if we move to a higher level, we move to the analytical level up here in the thoughtful cortex part. Um, how well does that do? How well if we're not on autopilot, if we're thinking and trying to analyze, this is the rational pilot, how well is he doing, he or she? And I think you're all aware at this point in modern America that we're all subject to a huge set of biases. We're guilty of associations. We're guilty of um, protecting a mindset, social influences, habits. Um, you know, if you, you've ever tried to develop a new habit, you know how hard it is to break out of the mold of what you do. But this for a pilot is the challenge. How do we work with this and become a safer, uh, thoughtful, aware pilot? So we're going to give you a few tools on that. And I'm going to keep marching along because I'm watching the clock. One thing that a lot of people aren't even aware of is that when we're flying or doing anything, what we do largely is stereotype. We look for patterns in the perceptual field. And we don't even see the other things that are on board that are happening. 
several good books are this one by uh, Dan uh, Gilbert, Harvard psychologist, and it's hilarious just looking at the way we mishandle our lives and things we think will bring us happiness, which are just useless. Um, my favorite is probably uh, this one here, the cognitive bias. You just Google that and you'll see about a hundred different cognitive biases. But one huge one for us is that the future will resemble the past. I can tell you pilots do this all the time. Flying from Ithaca, where I live, to Chicago is about a four-hour flight, and pilots will do that on a normal day, and they might do it twice, and they might do it five times, and pretty soon they say, this works. It worked before, it'll work again, and they forget that we don't have friction with the ground. We're working in an airflow that's moving west to east, and on certain days, it doesn't work, and we're going to be short. How do pilots run out of gas? Well, it worked before, it'll work again. This is one of the major biases that we're all guilty of. Um, I can tell you, it's just, it's, you know, examine the way you think, and you'll see it. We call this magical thinking. This was a pilot who flew a plane into a uh, proficiency seminar for Bonanza. And the tail was so corroded that we couldn't fly this plane. It became an example on the B triple P uh, page. And the pilot said, well, it worked before. You know, I flew it in here. And it's like, well, there's a point at which it will just stop working. And I think my favorite bias is what I call the Lake Wobegon one, which is 93% of drivers think that they're better than average. Uh, just a wonderful thing. And if you go to pilots and you say, who are the two best pilots in the world? They'll say, who's the other one? I mean, we're all kind of overconfident. I, one of the better examples probably is, you know, NASA, the smartest people in the world. And we had two situations where they did what we call normalizing. They took a situation which didn't comply to a standard, and they started to accept that as normal. And that's how humans function. If it works, we go with it. And as a pilot, if you start doing that, what you're doing is you're slowly reducing your margin of safety. There's a safety, uh, Sidney Decker is a very important and recognized safety specialist, and he calls that drifting into failure. We slowly reduce our margin of safety, and that's what happened with both the Challenger and the Columbia to the smartest people in the country. Uh, a lot of good data online if you just Google normalization of deviance. Uh, it's a very common human problem. This is a last example, and then I promise we'll get into some <laughs> real-life aviation and out of the psychology. This is the Stanford Strategic Decision-Making course. Uh, this ran for, I think, about 20 years at Stanford. And Chevron was one of the major investors in this, and they trained thousands of uh, decision makers for their company. Exxon did not. They had the Valdez, and BP did not, and they had the Deepwater Horizon. But the example they use frequently is if you were at a party, and this is a common human situation, and had a few too many drinks, and you decided to drive home. You're a little tipsy. Everyone's done it, unfortunately and you get home, does that validate your decision? Does the result you achieved validate that decision to drive while you're a little buzzed? And it absolutely does not. You just succeeded and maybe it was lucky. Turn that on its head and maybe you said at the party, oh, I'm a little tipsy, I'll get myself a designated driver. And you are riding home with a designated driver and you get T-boned and severely injured. Does that make the decision a bad decision because you had a bad outcome? And the fact is, it does not. We cannot judge decisions by outcomes, but that is how humans operate. So all of these errors I pointed out are things you should think about when you're flying. When you're flying into the ice runway, which I did, and I'm not proud of it. And, you know, it just becomes something that pilots do, but, you know, it ends up, unfortunately, not always working. So we have to always analyze at the end of a flight. Was that good result, the result of a good decision, or was it just luck? And I think too many times it's just a matter of luck. 
So these are the things that you really have to look at, that predictive perception, stereotyping, optimizing, and normalizing. And you have to take those out of your sort of way we think about doing anything. We have to be more reflective, aware, and mindful. And I even added fearful. Because as a pilot, you'll notice that the first time, oh, it's a little scary. Second time, it's a little less so. Third time, I got it wired. Um, and we become complacent. So to combat normalizing, we want to always, at the end of a flight, don't just put the plane away, put the chocks in, sit there for a moment and reflect, replay, and rate your flight. Think of how well you did, how you define success. Did I just get there? I want to make sure that future success is going to be a sure thing. And that's absolutely what we do in the corporate world. We're rating every flight. If I have an incident like a go-around, I have to talk to the director of operations. Uh, second is we want to conform to an objective standard. We don't want to be guilty of magical thinking. You want to really examine that and say, does this make sense? And having another pilot in the cockpit for me is a wonderful thing. It's like, this is what I'm thinking. I talk it through. I brief the approach. I get a feedback. So if you don't have a sort of trusted friend that you can bounce things off, you should. And it doesn't have to be a CFI. It can be an experienced pilot that can take that uh, role for you. The last thing is you want to make sure that you have freedom from stressors. Time is the big killer of pilots. Um, when we're in a hurry, we don't think reflectively. We don't engage in awareness and mindfulness. We just run a script, and we should be using our better brain. Just an example from the DPE world, when I assign a cross-country from Ithaca to Bradley, um, I can guarantee you this is what it's going to look like. Um, it's going to be a straight line because we know how people navigate, right? But it goes right over the hills. Um, and I'm always, you know, when I have an applicant for a flight test, it's like, how did you come up with that imaginative course uh, to get to Bradley? And I'm looking for, you know, a diversion over the hills. But GPS stands for going perfectly straight. And it's not always the best way to go. The time when you're planning is the opportunity to avoid errors. That's why we use this now, and it's part of the ACS. New pilots are getting this in every one of their flight tests. But pilots who are already rated may not have seen this. PAVE, Pilot Aircraft Environment External Pressures, is an excellent matrix to analyze your safety. Um, these slow motion accidents, I always call it Newton's fourth law, and that used to be what I, a pilot in motion tends to stay in motion. Once you get airborne and take a look, you're going to keep going, so be careful with that. 3D is, I like the three P's from the FAA, so I developed the three D's. If you think you have a problem, always have the time to maybe delay, divert, or drive. These are three ways to get out of trouble before you even start flying. Once you are flying, this is the process to use, perceive, process, perform, and it's what we call situational awareness. Um, and this was for Micah Ensley. She developed this, and about 77% of accidents are just failure to see the problem evolving. So we have to keep asking questions and stay in what we call in firearms training, code yellow, stay alert. The three R's, um, radar, resources, restaurants, and rental cars. What is this? This is when you have to divert. You should have these as alternates. The alternate should be something desirable, not a failure. It should be something you absolutely want to do. And if you have your family on board, you don't want to end up at some ugly local restaurant with broken stuff. You know, pick a big restaurant kind of airport that's got rental cars and resources. Toby's going to talk about the in the radar guy and helping you out. So make it an attractive choice. Lastly, I want to... Thank you for participating. I want to encourage you to be part of the FAA WINGS program. And like I said, you know, new things are coming. You may not have seen this topic of the quarter, but in a couple of months, it's going to all be changed, and hopefully we'll have a new format that will be more attractive and inviting. Thank you all for your time, and if you have a couple of questions, I'm ready for those now. 
All right, David, that was a great presentation. Thank you very much. I'm going to take the controls back here, I think. There we go. And we only have one question that's been typed in. I will take care of that. And if anybody else has any questions for David, just go ahead into your questions panel there. Just type them in, and, um, and I will read them. Uh, we don't open microphones anymore. We used to open microphones on these, and then this past summer we had an incident where <laughs> that wasn't the best thing to do. So uh, we'll respond to the typed in questions. Uh, what is here for you, David, is um, uh, it's from Robert. It says, really good reading slash reference selections. Can you publish a list of what you presented in this, uh, in this seminar? So one could select from the great smorgasbord. Uh, is there any way you could put that together and either put it up on safe or put it together and uh, send it to me? I could put it up on vectors or, you know, whatever. Yeah, I could, uh, I could absolutely publish that. And, I, you know, I, I love questions like that because I, it means, you know, there's so much information there and we can't present all in 20 minutes. But I will put that together. The other thing I'd say is if you go to safepilots.org, there's a whole resource center there. In other words, I run a not-for-profit organization called SAFE. And they provide an enormous number of resources. In fact, with the FAA, when we did that wing survey, we came out number one for resources. So there's a lot there already at safepilots.org. But I will send that to Gene, and he will forward it to the list. All right, thank you. That was uh, that's that's really good. And yeah, Safe is a great organization. I'm a member. If anybody isn't, I would uh, encourage anyone to get in there. Just one more thing popped up here. Just it's just a compliment uh, from JJ. It said, "Excellent presentation. Thank you." With a smiley face in there. Any other questions for David? Anything want to pop up there? No. Uh, David and I have uh, appeared together in a lot of presentations. He's right. We have to uh, be careful because we tend to talk about the same things. We're both kind of human factors guys, and uh, and it's really good. I've worked with David for many years now, and uh, it, it's been great. Another question just popped up. Um, and another. Here we go. This one is from Ryland, I believe it is. What is the best way to find the line in between pushing yourself to become a better pilot and knowing it's beyond a pilot's slash aircraft's capabilities? Wow, excellent question. That's one I would get all the time when I was running a flight school. How do I know how to expand my personal minimums? And the answer to that is to do it carefully and to leave yourself an out. Um, you know, when people get IFR certified, for instance, and I write them their new uh, instrument rating, they might not have been in the clouds at all. And the next step is going into the clouds, you know, and um, go en route, pick a 4,000 foot overcast, go into it, and you can always come back out of it. In other words, leave yourself an absolute golden way to um, move back. So don't attempt a 20 knot crosswind first time, you know, try it with an instructor and then work your way up step by step, always leaving yourself a safe option to get out of it. Great, thank you. Now we have some other questions coming up here. Uh, uh, James says, can you comment on checklist use? Excellent question too, and I would point you at a, and I can put it up on the SAFE website actually, I will do that after the show here. Tom Turner with the Bonanza Association, uh, bonanza.org, recently wrote an article which I thought was just perfect. Um, checklists should not be a do list, um, and this is how we use it in corporate aviation. You do a flow, you do the items, you know, from memory, and then you check that you did them. In other words, that gives you two ways to remember to do them, plus it accesses two parts of your brain, one being the reflective part and one being the very precise, you know, section there. So in, in a sense, you did it twice. If you have a co-pilot, they're going to read that to you yeah, as you do the items. So, but if that makes sense, it's not a do list, it's a checklist. Okay, good. Thanks. Also, uh, if you go to the Bright Spot Schools website, brightspotschools.com, um, there is a free course on there on checklist. It's fairly extensive. It's, uh, there's, there's four parts to it. Okay, next question from Dennis. Can you speak briefly about screening out persons we feel are not appropriate pilot candidates? SOP has been a key to aviation. Yeah, that's a very difficult, uh, because, you know, as I said, that Dr. Bill Rhodes um, slide share that's on LinkedIn, you know, we get those people coming into aviation and more and more with some of the YouTubes. 
and we know they're not appropriate candidates. It's very hard to change attitude. Um, and all I can say is, you know, you hold the keys to the castle if you're a CFI, and, you know, if you can't change them, you have to purge them. I mean, it's sad, but one of my friends said, take up bowling, you know, the ball always comes back. <laughs> but, um, there are some people who are just dangerous and shouldn't fly. But by and large, I think everybody, once you, you model safety and you show them the way, I like to mentor, which is when I had when I was running the club, I'd put them with a very safe pilot and sort of show them how the, the process should work. I think that is a, a very strong way to influence people's behavior. But it's very difficult, as we know, to change people's behavior when they have a bad attitude. Yeah, that's that's for sure. Okay, uh, I guess we got one more. This one's um, just a couple of positive comments. Uh, another one about the book titles you mentioned, and we addressed that. You'll send them to me, and we'll um, we'll get those up. And then one about the somebody requesting the website for the checklist course again. It's brightspotschools.com, and there'll be a list of courses on there. It's a free course. Just click on the uh, select the one for uh, for checklist. And I, I, yeah, I'm and if sure. you go I think to safepilots.org, I will link that to Gene's site, um, obviously. The uh, the app, the uh, Safe app, has the Toolkit app has a lot of uh, resources on there, check ride ready, and I can put something up. That's, that's my passion is getting resources to pilots, so I'll put something up on there for checklists. It's a common question. Yeah, that's that's uh that's an excellent website also. In case you didn't know, your attendance at this event today may qualify you qualify you for a premium discount um, on your renewal or a new uh, Vemco insurance policy. We thank Vemco for their sponsorship. Also, we want to thank our sponsor PilotToPilot.com for their support of this event. Pilots, you can reduce your cost of flying, fly with another pilot, post your flights, and view posted flights in your area by joining pilottopilot.com and um, Avia Flight Academy uh, always wanted to learn to fly Avia Flight Academy uh, your ultimate flight school in Connecticut offering all pilot ratings first flight experiences and young aviator Academy for teens dream big with us and learn to fly in a safe and fun environment using latest digital technology to enhance your learning experiences Visit us at aviaflightacademy.com. And the Westchester Aviation Association is your voice at the Westchester County Airport. We're an enthusiastic group of aviation professionals. Please join us at westchesteraviation.org. Super, super, super. All right. Next up is Nick Gregory. Nick is the chief meteorologist at... Uh, w, uh, WNYW TV Fox 5 News in New York City. In addition to his meteorologist duties, Nick is chief pilot and flight instructor in Cirrus Aircraft at Performance Flight located at KHPN, White Plains, and is also an FAA designated pilot examiner and also a captain for a Part 135 operation at Hopscotch Air. Nick's presentation today is titled Understanding and Best Practices of NEXRAD. Nick, there you are. We're going to try to switch presenters over to you. And Nick, you have the controls. Go ahead, sir. All right. Thank you very much. <clears throat> and uh, good morning, uh, Gene, and good morning, everyone. Thank you so much again for uh, allowing me to be here with you today and uh, to talk a little bit about uh, uh, radar. Um, again, this uh, uh, is uh, weather, of course, is a big thing for me, so uh, this might go a bit on to the uh, geeky side, <laughs> as you would say, as a meteorologist. Um, but I think uh, we'll cover some important issues, um, which uh, might be uh, valuable to you. Uh, I'd like to take it from two standpoints, uh, talking a little bit about just what is going on in an X-ray radar, and then how we have been applying that to uh, our various uh, opportunities in aviation through onboard information to, of course, iPad technology now uh, 15, 20 years ago, and you know, none of this stuff existed. So uh, sometimes maybe there's too much information that gets out there. Uh, we have to sort of sift through the good and the bad stuff, kind of what uh, David was just talking about, uh, 
know, half the stuff out there is awesome. Some of the other stuff out there is questionable. So uh, uh, this is uh, hopefully going to be some valuable information for you uh, to be able to uh, get more use out of uh, radar information that you might have on, uh, on board and, of course, uh, just in your pre-flight planning uh, purposes that we have with iPads and uh, those sort of uh, those sort of things. So uh, again, I've been flying for quite some time. I've been flying for about 38 years. Uh, I, I'm very fortunate that I've been able to follow uh, both uh, passions in my life of uh, both meteorology and, and aviation and sort of combine the two uh, together. So uh, from that standpoint, I, I want to share some of this passion and information to you. All right, so uh, let's uh, uh, see what's going on here. Again, we'll uh, hopefully you can see my uh, my screen and we'll start the PowerPoint here. Uh, there we go. Uh, so again, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, uh, what is, first of all, a radar, a Doppler radar here. Uh, some of this might be review for you, but it may uh, be some uh, new information that you haven't heard of before. So let's go a little bit about understanding what is going on with the next rad radar and how do we apply it. So uh, again, the radar is called the WSR Weather Service Radar 88-D. It's actually been around since the... Uh, since the 1980s, but it's gotten considerable upgrades uh, over the years. When it came out as the original uh, WSR-88D, standing for the Doppler radar, and of course it now has been uh, gone on to something called a dual polarimetric radar, and I'll talk a little bit about that here in just a second. So what do we get out of the WSR radar? We get NEXTRAD level 2 and level 3 data. So there is a distinct difference between the two. Okay, level 2 data, that's just plain raw data that comes from the radar. Uh, that we just take a look at. That's kind of some of that is the meteorological geeky stuff that we look at. We tend to look at more pixels than uh, other things. And, and then there's the level three radar, right? So this process, uh, uh, process the data that comes out that you would get from, uh, from the radar. So the National Weather Service uh, will tend to display level three data. Most of your apps on your phone, your, your, if you use uh, uh, any kind of a pilot weather app or if you use uh, like a My Radar or something like that, uh, websites will use this level three data. And this is the type of data that you also get onto your iPad and you also get onto your cockpit weather system. So uh, there's the, uh, the sort of the difference between the two. Uh, you can see the uh, level three data versus the level two data. The level two data, just really the raw data on the right there. Uh, much more pixelated, much more detailed, and the level three data, not quite as, as detailed, whatever, but uh, you'll see some of this makes up what we call base reflectivity and composite reflectivity. It's two, two little different areas that we're going to talk about. All right, so as we take a look at the uh, level three data, because that's what we're all going to be using pretty much, uh, what tends to happen is, uh, again, the, the raw data on the left or the, the level three data then can be smoothed out in these, these anti-aliasing process that goes on just makes it more appealing to look at, right? So if you, you take a look at both of these, again, which one are you familiar with? You're, most of you are familiar with the one on the right. That's what, you, that's what we see. That's what we see on our iPads. That's what we see uh, on uh, our uh, in-flight data, uh, depending, again, on how you're displaying it um, in the cockpit. And the problem is, though, when we do the smoothing, sometimes we lose important features of a storm. And so keep this in mind, again, when you're flying uh, with data that you're seeing what's out there, but you might be losing some of the real good stuff that we talk about here. Okay, so what's going on as far as base reflectivity and composite reflectivity? So uh, next rad radars, uh, you know, they tend to uh, uh, show different modes, right? They, they, they scan in different modes and different elevations, and that's how we tend to uh, identify what the storm structure is. And we're going to talk a little bit about now what goes on with both base reflectivity and composite reflectivity, and uh, which is better. What's, what's the one that we really want to take a look at? So the base reflectivity is just a single antenna elevation, usually just tilting up slightly uh, from the horizon, about a, five, a 0.5 degree uh, tilt up. And what that does is it uh, tends to have the radar beam then rise as it goes away from the radar site. So by five miles out, that radar beam is sitting at about 5,000 feet. The further out, at 124 miles, let's say, that's about the short range um, effectiveness that we would call it. 
the beam's already up to 22,000 plus feet. So it's now starting to scan the higher parts of the storm. And so that's why we say with reflectivity, you want to, or base reflectivity, we want to discuss how this is more valuable uh, when you're doing a sort of a low level invest. Um, when we're doing uh, storm coverage at the television station, uh, with the National Weather Service, let's say, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to look at, at the low uh, activity going on here, the, the, the lower scan, because it's going to tell me what's going on in the lower part of the atmosphere. Uh, will I see rotation? Will I see uh, an outflow boundary? Uh, will I see a microburst developing? Those types of things. So, so this is where base reflectivity really comes into play. Uh, here's an example. Again, if you look at how that works from the radar, uh, as the radar beam goes out uh, from uh, the tower, uh, it sees the storms in the lower levels, and then as you get further away, it can actually overshoot some of the precipitation and make the storm seem less innocuous than it actually is. Uh, part of the other problem is, is and I'm not going to get into it today because you know we have a sort of limited amount of time, is refraction and how the radar beam tends to bend uh, for a variety of reasons, but. Uh, that we'll have to hold that for another day <laughs> when we have a little more time. All right, now we switch to composite reflectivity. So this now scans at multiple elevation angles. So it's, the radar is working hard here to not just do that low level, but it's doing uh, a variety of different levels. And so uh, it will identify the maximum echo intensity from an, uh, any elevation angle at every range. So it becomes a much more valuable uh, as far as information is concerned. Uh, again, what we find here is um, uh, uh, that, let me just lower this off here a second. Um, there we go. I, sorry, I hit a button, wrong button here on the computer. Uh, so uh, again, we have the short range that goes out about 124 miles, and then the longer range that goes out to a 248 mile range. But that becomes a larger, blockier picture, so it's not necessarily uh, uh, the most, uh, one second, I'm just, I just hit another wrong button on my computer. All right, there we go. So a little more optimal again, uh, as far as those larger blockier pictures that you have. And uh, again, the scan can overshoot here the low line precipitation. So it's doing the opposite of what the base reflectivity is doing at this point. Uh, but overall, it gives us a better picture of total storm coverage, both vertically and horizontally. So uh, a better measure of storm intensity. So when you're getting your XM weather or you're getting your Fizz B, we'll call it, uh, now into the cockpit, this is what you're getting. You're getting the composite uh, reflectivity data. Uh, although I will say on an iPad here in a second, uh, you actually can choose base reflectivity and get the lower range. So that's what it looks like. You remember the previous diagram that I showed you was just sort of that one single elevation that was coming out. But when you look at the composite reflectivity actually looking at uh, a storm cell per se, you can see that it is using uh, multiple levels uh, slicing through the storm. All right, so this is gonna be kind of an interesting uh, get here. Um, what I did was, uh, there was a storm event here on August uh, 27th, it's a Thursday afternoon. And uh, if you're not familiar with the, uh, the app called Radar Scope, uh, I, strongly recommend you try it out. It's uh, a, a, a fantastic tool. Again, it's kind of a geeky meteorological tool, but you get, you know, NEXRAD data and you get a variety of the information that comes from each NEXRAD radar site. So uh, what we're going to do is I'm going to show you some of the properties of this and again, uh, just understanding what comes out of a NEXRAD and how we would look at it as a meteorologist and how you can actually take a look at this when you're trying to analyze a storm structure yourself and make a decision about you know what to fly this is, this would be more for a pre-flight analysis because using your radar scope tool uh, would get a little difficult in the cockpit but um, this is again a, a a view of a storm moving through connecticut i don't know if, if some of you in uh, the area uh, back on august 27th remember the severe outbreak that we had and i'm using the uh, the albany radar site here and what we're looking at is the uh, the super reflectivity, uh, the lowest tilt. So as the meteorologist, again, as I come over here, you can see my little cursor. So I'm looking at these pixels. The pixels are really what I tend to uh, try to analyze what's going on here. And again, remember reflectivity, it's just the radar is sending out a signal, bouncing off what it sees, and then returning back to the radar site. So 
this is a, a, a fairly recent image from the storm itself, it's about a two-minute uh, uh, scan. And uh, so we've got you know, great detail here on the ref reflectivity so I can see exactly what's going on. Now we switch to the composite reflectivity of the same event. And notice the difference in the pixelation, right? So, uh, and it makes it a little more ominous. <laughs> uh, so we, we uh, can compare the two, again, to go back to the real pixelated image and then the composite uh, reflectivity of the same storm. Now let's go to the velocity mode. This is something, again, that we can look at as meteorologists uh, to sort of analyze, again, the data coming out of the next red system. So what am I looking for here? I'm looking for any kind of shear, any kind of shift uh, to potentially indicate either a microburst developing or potentially rotation. So I'm looking for a color change. And where do I see that color change? I see that right over in here. So I see red going one way, starts of green going the other way. And lo and behold, they're going to confirm the next day that an F1 tornado, EF1 tornado formed right in here. So I was looking at this in real time because we were detecting, again, the shear going on uh, with that system. The other thing we get out of the, the Doppler radars, and then you can get this uh, again on your, if you do get the app radar scope, uh, uh, disclaimer, I will say, it, it, I think the basic one costs about $10 for the subscription. You can go higher than that if you really want to get geeky meteorology <laughs> uh, like me. Uh, but uh, what this tends to show here is uh, what we call skits or uh, storm tracking. And in this case, again, it's telling me that uh, it was a mesocyclone, uh, potential, you know, hail, and the mesocyclone was moving to the east-southeast at 37 knots. And it noticed it put down a little rotation indicator saying that it is detecting shear and potential rotation. And you can see it also provides the track guidance here as that storm moved across southern sections of Connecticut. So what I want to do now is sort of match this up. And I can match where on the left you see the, uh, the wind shift, the color shift, from greens to reds, indicating the rotation. And sure enough, it mapped it out as far as um, indicating the possible rotation. And like I said, the next day it would be confirmed that that was an EF1 tornado that formed there. So what else can I detect out of the velocity mode of a, of a Doppler radar, of an X-rad radar? And that's if there's any kind of uh, a potential uh, straight line wind damage coming. And this is the same storm if it was just located uh, over here before. And now it's now moved across Long Island Sound. And we're getting a little hit here. So uh, potentially now the North Shore uh, may be either getting some potential rotation here or more so it's going to be uh, uh, some very straight line wind damage uh, coming out of the storm. Uh, this whole area, by the way, was under a tornado watch for much of the afternoon, which was, uh, again, put out very validly because of the data that we saw there. All right, so those are the, uh, the base reflectivity and some of the uh, wind velocity uh, data coming in. But I mentioned at the beginning of the discussion here about these radars are now all called dual polar metric or dual polarization. And all the Weather Service radars have been upgraded to this. And what does it do? It, it gives me from not just what the conventional older radar did, which was send the horizontal pulse, but now it's scanning rapidly in both horizontal and vertical. So what does that allow me to do? Well, that's going to now allow me to look at particulate size. So if I take a look at the, uh, the radar beam itself and what the data that it gets back, it can actually analyze size of droplets, size of, of particles versus snow versus grapple versus hail. And the algorithms built in the radar site will actually then tell me what it thinks it's seeing. And then I can do a little digging in deeper myself to figure out what is the radar actually seeing? This has become great in the wintertime now when we're trying to determine, you know, rain snow line or rain or snow versus sleet. Uh, you know, sleet uh, it has a much different signal and it, it allows us to really forecast that. And it allows us to now also look at a hail shaft, which we can see very clearly when we look at some of this data. So one of the modes that the, all, the, uh, the Doppler radars will scan in now is called the hydrometeor class. So when I look at the hydrometeor class, in this particular case, if you remember that cell coming up to the North Shore of Long Island, uh, that velocity was indicating something was going on there. And in the hydrometeor mode, it's now detecting large hail. And that's that, there's a little 
scale on the bottom here just when you're using radar scope you can just kind of take your finger over it and uh, it'll tell you what these different colors uh, represent so here it's suggesting that there was large hail being detected by the radar it was actually looking at the hail shaft which is pretty effective and the other data that we get is something called a correlation coefficient I know this might be starting to blow your brain up a little bit <laughs> here, but uh, the correlation coefficient is always doing the same kind of thing. It's measuring sizes of particulates. And it has a little scale at the bottom again. This kind of tells me uh, within a certain range what it's looking at as far as particulates flying around in the air. And in this case, the, the suggestion was, again, that there was large hail being detected. So I'm, I'm taking all of the pieces of this information and putting it together to determine what weather hazard is coming out. Uh, in the uh, Midwest, they use the uh, cor this correlation coefficient to actually uh, find debris. So when they're trying to find a tornado, they can actually see the debris being blown around uh, by this correlation coefficient, which is pretty incredible. All right, so given all that, what, how does this apply then to us as pilots? So again, whether you're getting it via XM weather or you're getting it through ADSB or FISB, how are we displaying it in the cockpit? And are you using an iPad? both in, either in the cockpit and in your pre-flight planning. Uh, so we have, again, the FISB being uh, coming up from ground stations. And then we have the XM that comes down from the, uh, from the satellite. And in the FISB case, of course, there's no monthly subscription required, but you're going to pay a little bit for the XM weather, anywhere from $30 to $100 a month. Uh, you'll get the essential weather on FISB and METARs and uh, TFRs, those types of things. and on the XM, you'll get uh, higher end data, uh, satellite storm uh, movement, uh, storm cell movement, that type of deal. So the FISB, think of it as like a VOR reception, right? So you're getting ground stations, about 700 of them for broadcast, and it's based on line of sight. So at higher altitudes, it does great. At lower altitudes and mountainous areas, not so great. And, uh, you know, three to 5,000 feet, you'll see, uh, you know, most of the reception around the country here. But if you're sitting on the ground, you're probably not going to see all that much. All right, satellite uh, data, no restrictions, right? You get it no matter where you are, uh, as long as it's not an outage. <laughs> uh, great and for flying low altitude in remote locations, and you'll get all the weather products even sitting on the ramp. Uh, you can see the difference in coverage between ADSB uh, on the left and the, the XM weather uh, on the right, you know, coverage more so in uh, Canada and extending down into uh, Mexico uh, and parts of the Caribbean. So on FISB, the high-resolution NEXRAD images uh, uh, sort of close in and a low-resolution national NEXRAD image where, again, you sort of have a single resolution coming in on the XM. Uh, you don't get satellite, as I mentioned, on the FISB, but you will on the XM. Uh, METARs and TAFs come within about 500 miles of your plane, and again, in the XM, you get all the weather to you simultaneously. But you're paying for it, right? It's, it's costing you more money in that respect. Uh, so as we take a look at the two images here, there's ADSB on the left and there's Sirius XM on the right, and you can see the pixelation is a little bit different. And we're going to talk a little bit about that here in just a second as to why that is the case. And here's a, a view of a uh, XM. And if you notice, again, around the whole country, there's, there's, uh, the data pretty much looks the same. There's no change in the pixelation. Uh, there's no change in, in how it's displayed. So we're just sort of looking at, a, at the whole picture here, and it, whether you're at a wide-angle view or at a close angle view, it really is about the same. But if you look at the FISB data, if you notice here from left to right, how the data goes from being extremely pixelated to these big blockier pixels. So the resolution, again, sort of decreases as you go out. And, uh, you know, for most of us flying GA aircraft, this is fine, right? Because our, our ground speed, our, our, you know, is, uh, what are we doing, 100 to 200 knots, let's say, in most GA aircraft. So that far away data is not so important to us, but you know, if you're flying around in a citation like David does, you know, this data, uh, the longer range data may not be so valuable because by the, uh, given that the data could be a bit on the older side, uh, allowing for a, sort of an error in, in how it's presented. And this is why those images are a little bit different, right? So the radar intensity or how the radar hears, the DBZ, how it hears the precipitation is shown with different colors. So the internet is on the left, your ADSB is in the middle, or your FISB, and then the XM color is on the right. So, you know, you tend to get smoothing between the different levels of precipitation, and 
So one can tend to make things look a little more ominous than the other. FISB has six intensity ranges, and the XM has seven intensity ranges. I'm more familiar with the four flight. I really don't use much with Garmin Pilot. I mean, I see applicants bring them to check rides, um, but I, I'm more of a four flight user. So I just wanted to show you the difference between FISB and XM. XM tends to be a little more overdone in some of the precipitation, uh, how it's presented on the graphic system, but uh, it kind of gives you an idea of the difference between uh, the two pictures there. All right, so let's talk about base reflectivity versus composite reflectivity. And I sort of put these two images up alongside here because you can see the same scan showing different things. And as we take a look at this and analyze it a little deeper, notice that position one in the uh, base reflectivity, you're not even seeing the, uh, the little fuchsia color there, which could have been you know, fairly severe weather going on. And also notice the difference on the right here, the overhang in taking place here in the composite side. That could be a couple of things. That could be the anvil cloud, the stretching out. So, or it could be just precipitation sort of stuck aloft. Uh, you can also notice in here how the precipitation changes as far as its depiction. And again, those notches, you know, could be showing that there's more updrafts going on in advance of that storm. So, uh, getting back to you know, knowing what you're looking at, right? What it, obviously we just want to avoid all of this in general. But uh, what, what am I looking at here, and how do I analyze this data? And it sort of gives you an idea of, of where some of the data can be misleading, or you really need to look at several images to get an idea of what's out there. And here's a that classic example of how that upper level precipitation was not picked up at all at the base level. And again, here's how it would look like on four flight, uh, the lowest tilt option. By the way, there's a, if you, when you go to four flight, you can look at your, your uh, Radar options, you can actually select lowest tilt if you wanted to, uh, or you can stay with the composite view uh, on the right. Subtle differences though, right? If you look again here at the storm, oops, let me go back one. You look at this guy here, and then you look over here, notice the anvil, potential anvil, you know, precipitation that's held aloft, which means, you know, eventually that's gotta come down. <laughs> so I don't necessarily wanna be flying underneath that anvil, but here, it doesn't really show it. Storm attributes. So these are great to use. Again, you can see them on, on uh, ForeFlight now as well. This is kind of what I showed you on the radar scope. Uh, so uh, if you notice here, it's showing a little rotation, a little mesocyclone, as well as here. Like you can overlay your lightning detection on there. It's actually showing you storm movement and cloud tops, right? So, you know, the pretty impressive stuff that goes on uh, with the data we can get now on our iPads. Uh, but this is uh, sort of taking, like I said, the, the, the storm attributes that we would get from the Doppler radar and applying it uh, into flight, uh, where I can see the potential hazard of, uh, of, uh, of danger. And I think it's got a little tornado symbol there. So definitely impressive stuff to take a look at. So when I want to compile all this data together, I, have, I can take my radar data and I can take my, my echo top data and sort of match the two and see what am I doing here. And this actually has the storm attributes attached to it as well. Again, the little mesocyclone symbol here and the little tornado symbol here. Uh, and kind of get an idea of, you know, how intense the storms are by looking at the echo tops and looking at the lightning radar data uh, combined. So taking all the pieces of the information together. Finally, important of all, and I think you have all heard this time and time again, but I'm going to reemphasize it once more, is respect the delay. So as you, when I started the talk, you saw that one composite radar on the, four, on the uh, radar scope was 10 minutes old. Why are we talking these delays and why do we need to respect them? So the data comes from the radar site, gets sent to the transmitter, up to the satellite, back down to the NOAA processing center. From there, their computers go to work, send the data back up to the satellite, back down to the vendor. There, the vendor data goes to work. Then it sends it back up to the satellite back down to either ads, ads B or then on into your airplane. So, you know, you could talk uh, delays of three to five minutes up to 10 minutes. And in a rapidly developing situation, uh, you can see how this can really get you. So again, respect the delay, understand why the delay happens, and take that into account into your flight plan. So um, I think I'm just about out of time. So uh, 
I hope that that uh, that worked for you. And uh, all righty. Well, thank I'll you, come back. Nick. Well, I'm going to take the controls back here, and there we go. I think we'll see what comes up. There we go. Uh, let's see what questions came up for you. And if if you have another question for uh, for Nick, go ahead and type it into your question panel there, and I will send it on to him. We got it, uh, several that are just complimentary. Um, uh, this one says, um, will this be recorded and is it available to share later? Uh, I'll answer that one. I am recording it and I'm hoping to uh, be able to put it up on my YouTube channel within about a week. I've never actually tried to put one that was four hours long on before, so we'll see. And maybe we'll have to break it up into the different segments, but uh, that, that is the, the intent to do that. Uh, this person also says, great presentation on weather. And he goes on to say, uh, uh, I encourage all pilots to obtain seaplane and glider ratings where we really get into weather on a personal level. And thanks again. And uh, this is from Obi, and we, we know Obi. He's uh, been very active in producing uh, things for the FAA uh, down in Florida. What, what are your thoughts on uh, the glider and seaplane ratings, Nick? Uh, sure. Oh, well, listen, have you, any rating you can get uh, make you a better pilot. But, uh, you know, if you think about, uh, you know, the understanding the uh, uh, the uh, aerodynamics going on with just using gliders and, of course, the seaplane uh, the, the, both are on my list. I don't actually don't have either of those ratings yet, but uh, I, I would say that would be awesome. Uh, certainly, uh, a glider to understand, uh, you know, your updrafts and downdrafts, and you know how the air actually flows. Okay, good. Thank you. Another question: uh, Do you know, and can you tell us what kind of data shows up when you use Flight Plan Go when connected to the internet, not ADSB? So that's likely to be, again, the data coming from, uh, they'll pull it from the uh, National Weather Service. Uh, you're likely, again, to see composite uh, data. Uh, it likely doesn't use XM or any of those features. They probably have an arrangement with the, with the National Weather Service data, but some of the what I was just showing you that was on radar scope, very similar to the radar scope type data that they would then pull into their data feed and make available to everybody. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, all right, let's see. There's a couple here regarding what ATC can see, and I would suggest we hold that off for Toby after Toby's presentation, since he's an ATC guy. Um, okay, here's another one for you, Nick. It says uh, radar option, and what does ra no? I'm sorry. What does the show four color radar option mean in four flight? My show experience four color. with co cockpit weather is that one has to compare what's on the screen with what one is seeing out the window. Can you comment? Yes. So the four color radar option uh, actually is great for those of you that fly with onboard radar. Uh, so what it what it does is it matches the color code that your onboard radar has been assigned. So when you switch to the four color option on uh, on uh, on your four flight, what it does is it matches the, those pixels. Uh, what it will tend to do is make the storm look a little more ominous. Uh, because as I showed you in that little uh, diagram of uh, how the colors are pixelated uh, from green down to magenta, so when it goes only into the four color mode, it then tends to uh, to uh, make the storm look a little more ominous. But it really is more useful uh, to match it up if you're flying with onboard radar on your airplane. All right, thank you. And we have time for one more. Does ForeFlight allow you to use XM weather without a separate receiver for it? Hmm, that's a very good question. Uh, I don't believe. Uh, I mean, I, you, it, it, you'll get your uh, your uh, information uh, if you turn on weather on uh, just your satellite reception or your if you're getting it over a 4G network, let's say, uh, versus what you would get. Stratus. Uh, I think the, the Stratus allows you to get all the other pieces of information that you would normally not be able to get by just radar itself. So radar itself comes on to ForeFlight. Uh, you can just kind of click it on and you'll get it uh, either through your GPS reception of the ForeFlight, of your iPad or your iPhone, let's say. Uh, but if you want all the other data, I think that come, has to come through your Stratus connection. 
uh, which takes it right down from the satellite. Okay. How about uh, how about one more? Are there restrictions? Oh, uh, never mind. That wouldn't really apply. Uh, excellent. What do you think of windy.com and or earth.nullschool.net? <laughs> <laughs> I haven't worked with the latter the latter one at all. Uh, the windy.com is it's interesting. Uh, again, I've only worked with that a little bit because I, I had uh, two friends of mine that sort of suggested to take a look at it and see what it's all about. Um, I, it's another valuable tool. Uh, to uh, get your pre-flight analysis going. So uh, if you have the time, I, I'd check it out. Uh, I, I certainly uh, would recommend it. Again, I, I don't know the latter one, though. I haven't worked with it at all. Okay. Very good, Nick. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. We're going to have a poll that Nick submitted, but first we have a, a word from our sponsor. <laughs> Bright Spot Schools is a sponsor and also the producer of this event. Check out brightspotschools.com for a variety of both aviation and non-aviation programs and services. See what we mean by learning at a higher level. All right, now we're going to launch a poll, the first of our polls of the day. And that should be it. Hey, there it is. I see it. It worked. How do you get your next rad data into the cockpit? Check all that apply. Now, as we said in the beginning, in case you missed it, um, participation in the polls is used to verify that you are actually here and not off mowing your lawn or something with the presentation running in the background. Uh, so the answer isn't critical for getting Wings credit. It is just to verify that you were there. All right. We're, we have 70% have voted so far. Seventy-seven percent. We'll give it another few seconds. Votes are still coming in, but slowing down. Seventy-nine percent. My experience has been that we oh, there we get eighty. So my experience has been that about eighty percent is about all you get on most of these. Yep, it seems to be stagnant at eighty percent, eighty-one percent. Okay, going to close the poll in five, four, three. Two, one, and there we go. Just to give uh, viewers an idea of what we have here, uh, Sirius XM came in at 33%. Oh, I can share that. There we go. <laughs> Sirius XM 33%, ADSB at 58, other at 11, and I do not use Nexrad at 22%. All right. Thank you for your participation in that. And with that, we will move ahead. Mid-Island Air Service, with two locations, Islip, MacArthur, and Brookhaven Airports, is a full-service FBO providing flight training, both Part 61 and Part 141. Uh, they have rentals, fuel sales, and AMP services. We maintain our flight school fleet as well and provide retail services, including 100-hour annual pre-buys, as well as stock Cessna and aftermarket parts. Visit us at midislandair.com or Facebook um, slash midislandair. And that's all there up there on the screen. You can take a look at that. Good operation to, uh, to work with. Very good reputation. All right. And um, from a VF Flight Academy, there are many choices. Look no further. A VF Flight Academy, everything you need from a flight school, safety, training, structure, technology, top-notch instructors, affordable prices, and a welcoming environment. Visit us at aviafightacademy.com and schedule a free consul consultation. We are here for you, Avia Flight Academy, and we appreciate their sponsorship. And again, the Westchester Aviation Association is your voice at Westchester County Airport. We're an enthusiastic group of aviation professionals. Please join us at westchesteraviation.org. We want to thank our... Uh, Sponsor pilot2pilot.com for their support of this event. Pilots, you can reduce your cost of flying, fly with another pilot. Post your flights and view posted flights in your area by joining pilot2pilot.com. And Aircraft Specialty Services is your one-stop shop for general aviation. If you need new parts, our knowledgeable and friendly sales staff is here to meet your needs. Don't forget to ask about special pricing 
for our machine shop customers. Call today and let Aircraft Specialty Services exceed your expectations. You can get their phone number and all their other information by going to their website, aircraftspecialties.aero. All right, next up, we want to welcome Ace Rowley. Ace is a veteran of the United States Air Force, a retired police sergeant, and an instrument-rated private pilot turned aspiring CFI. In his law enforcement career, Ace held numerous assignments such as recruit training officer, crisis hostage negotiator, detective, and crime scene teen supervisor. He also served as a police academy instructor, use of force and defensive tactics trainer, and member of the Critical Incident Review Board. Ace is now part of the management team at Rochester Air Center, a Part 141 flight training center based in Rochester, New York. His presentation is titled, Stress Inoculation, Applying Principles of Law Enforcement, Critical Incident Preparedness to Aviation Training Emergencies. Um, you're you're going to like this. Uh, Ace and I talked a little bit about, about this and being a human factors guy, this is right up my alley and training and yeah, I think it's great. All right, I'm going to click the button here to change presenters. And Ace, you have the controls. Are you there, sir? I hope I'm here. Can you hear me? <laughs> we got gotcha. you. Great. Thank you. Let's uh, see if we can start this presentation. Yay. <laughs> All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, just a quick thanks to Gene for inviting me to be here. At the online format is uh, not typical for me. This is a first presentation that I'm, or first time that I'm giving this presentation to pilots as well, but uh, I think it's a privilege to be a part of the aviation community, and I'm excited to uh, share some of the insights that I've learned over the years uh, as a law enforcement trainer, and, you know, I've had some conversations with people uh, recently in talking about aviation safety and, and training to uh, you know, deal with emergencies, and as we've talked about those things, I've thought, wow, a lot of this is really kind of correlates to the things that, that we talk in law enforcement, things that I, you know, some, some uh, mentality that we used in training uh, as a police academy instructor and things, so uh, I'll get right into it here. So law enforcement officers are, you know, often faced with making split-second decisions, uh, whether it's an armed suspect with a firearm uh, or, you know, dealing with a pursuit or something like that. Uh, and those kinds of things tend to inflict some stress on our bodies. Uh, and the way that we deal with that or better, the way that we train for that uh, can be really important in the way that we sort of instinctively react to that. So the idea of, of stress inoculation is, you know, really the idea that training acts as an inoculation to that kind of severe stress. Um, you know, just as we get a vaccination for a virus, some exposure to that virus is what gives us the resistance to that, uh, you know, when we're, you know, been exposed to it in, in a life scenario. Same with, with stress inoculation, that exposure uh, in kind of a dynamic training environment um, is, is going to inoculate us to be able to deal with the kind of stress that we might encounter uh, in, in really a life-threatening scenario. So I'll just start this with a brief story. When I first started training in, in law enforcement uh, as a military police officer, um, we used to do uh, building clearing drills where we would go inside and, and you know, one of our members would act as uh, a suspect and they would hide uh, somewhere in the building and then we would send a team of officers in to, to search for them and we kind of go in and, and, you know, search with our finger guns out, um, practicing the, the techniques of how to clear a building. And in doing that, we would frequently say, you know, the bad guy pops out and says, bang, bang, you're dead. Uh, and the evaluator or, you know, a supervisor who was sort of monitoring that scenario would say, all right, now you're out of the fight, so the rest of the team has to continue on and, you know, clear this building without you because you've been shot and you're out of the fight. And so for years we trained in this idea of bang, bang, you're dead, bang, bang, you're dead. Um, there were subsequently situations where uh, officers in a real-life life-threatening scenario were shot 
and they sustained non-life-threatening injuries, but during all of their training and the conditioning that they had done mentally, they were taught, bang, bang, you're dead. And so they take this, you know, non-life-threatening injury and ultimately wind up giving up, laying down, believing that, you know, not that they're dead, but essentially that they're out of the fight. So what we did was modify the, the way that we train to train our brains into an idea of more like bang, bang, you're not dead, right? Uh, bang, bang, you're injured. You need to find cover. You need to call for medical assistance. We need to protect this person. We need to follow this through to a positive outcome uh, in a way that we can, you know, go in and rescue the officer if they're injured and we can provide the assistance that they need. And when you do those things over and over again, and then that, you know, once in a lifetime scenario happens where you really have to deal with this, uh, you, your instinctive reaction is to do things correctly um, and not fall down and give up. So, you know, fear makes us irrational. Uh, and the idea in a life or death scenario is that we need to find a way to manage that fear. Uh, and I also, you know, believe that attitude controls outcomes. So if we train to a survival mindset, uh, that's the mindset that's going to kick in when, when things really happen. So I'm just going to turn my camera off here for a little bit so you can just see the presentation. So part of this theory is understanding the effects of stress, what really survival stress is. And again, you know, we're training to a, a once in a lifetime potentially uh, scenario. And I'm not talking about the good or bad decisions that got us into this. Uh, it, it's a scenario where we're in it and now we need to react to this and we need to do it in a way that's potentially gonna, going to save our lives. I think an important part of building that reaction into your brain is understanding uh, what kinds of stress our body is going to, you know, subject us to sometimes uncontrollably when this kind of situation happens. So, you know, survival stress is something where you're immediately startled, like, you know, everything goes from zero to 100 instantly. Uh, you're going to get this jolt of adrenaline, you're going to get this jolt of fear potentially, uh, and, and we have to inoculate ourselves, we have to train ourselves to be able to react to that uh, instinctively. Um, if your time to respond to this threat is, is minimal, that creates survival stress. Uh, you know, you're, you're responsible for other people, potentially passengers or students in your aircraft. That's potentially going to induce that survival stress response. If you don't have adequate confidence in your skill level, uh, you know, something happens and you don't instinctively know what to do or you haven't been exposed to this scenario before and you, you hesitate, uh, that hesitation can increase the level of stress that we... Oh, I don't know what... Sorry about that. Bear with me just a second here. Uh, this kind of brings us to the fight, flight, or freeze, or the fight or flight response. It's something that just automatically happens. It's uncontrollable, uh, it dominates all parts of our body until the threat is gone. Uh, and we can, we can train ourselves to, you know, react to this in a way that's advantageous to us. You know, fight is certainly more advantageous than running away. In an airplane, we don't really have the option to do that. Uh, and so I think what we may encounter uh, you know, with, with student pilots, what we may encounter with ourselves in this life-threatening scenario is, is freezing, and we have to find a way to overcome that. Uh, some of the effects of survival stress, I think it's important, again, to know uh, what's going to happen to our body when this happens. Um, you know, you, you don't really have control over some of these things, and so I think a discussion up front and knowing that what you're experiencing is normal uh, and that you have the ability to push through this, to sort of put it aside, put your focus back on flying the airplane and dealing with whatever this emergency is that's in front of you, I think that's important. So, you know, rapid breathing, cotton mouth, tremors, sweaty palms, uh, your loss of ability to concentrate, 
peripheral vision, increased heart rate. We're going to get into some of this here as we go. Um, there is a thing called the inverted U hypothesis, which essentially says that your performance starts to increase as, as stress and heart rate increase up to a certain point. And so training, the idea of stress inoculation is to train ourselves to the point where we're operating in that area where you know our performance is at peak. An increase in heart rate is okay. Uh, an increase in stress is okay up to a certain point. Then it starts to decline. So we have to learn to fight that decline. I think it's important to talk about motor skills. Uh, they sort of play into this. So fine motor skills are, are something like tuning a radio frequency, being able to reach over and specifically see the numbers on the transponder. I, I would suggest that probably for many of you that have done, uh, you know, engine out drills with your instructor, and until you get farther into that scenario and have calmed yourself down a little bit, the last thing on your mind is, tuning one to 1.5, you know, setting the transponder to 7,700. You're flying the airplane, you are, you know, establishing your best glide speed, uh, you're identifying your landing field, those kinds of things. Those aren't fine motor skills as much. The fine motor skills are, you know, required dexterity. Uh, and that sort of goes out the window as your heart rate starts to increase. Complex motor skills is sort of where we want to be operating, right, in that best peak performance, survival performance area. Um, a series of muscle groups in a series of movements. We don't have to really stop and refine small movements, but here, you know, manipulating the flight, flight controls, turning the yoke, pushing the rudder pedals, those kinds of things are complex motor skills. And in a survival stress scenario, those can start to deteriorate. Uh, gross motor skills is sort of what we get left with when we're in this startle response, we're in this survival mode. Uh, your brain, I, I call it the caveman brain, right? Uh, David got into this a little bit as well, the, you know, the reptilian brain or, you know, the, the parts of your brain that are just reverting to survival mode. Uh, so part of what we can train to, again, with stress inoculation is training the caveman brain so that you just, you don't really have to think it's an instinctive reaction if you have a sudden loss of airspeed, you push, right? That kind of thing uh, versus detailed techniques. Um, when this happens, we have the startle response, our, our, our life is in danger. Your body is generically gonna start directing blood flow to your vital organs. Uh, so you can have a loss of circulation, your hands get cold, you lose dexterity, your vision starts to become inhibited. Uh, these are things that you should understand up front and recognize up front because when you experience that in the moment, you can know this is normal, this is expected, and I'm going to press through it. Um, when your brain becomes focused on a threat, it tends to tune in sensory systems that provide relevant information. Uh, many times that is vision, uh, generically provides the most relevant information, uh, and your brain can stop processing information from other places because it sees it as kind of taking a back seat to your survival in this moment. So, you know, in a, in a crewed aircraft situation, uh, your first officer, your, your co-pilot, your student, your instructor may be saying something to you and you don't even hear it. Uh, so it's, it's important in these situations that if you have to communicate, that you, you know, communicate clearly, loudly, make a point of saying things a couple of times, you know, and instructors, if it's something really important that you need your student to do, you may be speaking to them and they may not be hearing you at all because their brain is just taken over and, and has them, you know, focused on what they see and not what they hear. Um, visual exclusion, again, your, your body will, will tend to, you know, focus on the things that it finds the most important. And so um, the center of your vision, what's really right in front of you is the most important. Uh, you, you're potentially going to have some tunnel vision, loss of near vision, loss of your ability to focus. So you see the things that are on the slide here, loss of night vision. Uh, so, you know, everything sort of just closes into that little tunnel in front of you, which 
in some you know aviation scenarios can be pretty dangerous if we've lost an engine we're looking for you know uh, the best place to, to land the airplane but all we see is the propeller in front of us or the instrument panel the attitude indicator something like that you're going to have to force yourself to take a deep breath and look around uh, you know get outside the cockpit get your 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 eyes outside um, and, and combat that you know your body's natural response to that makes you want to see what's up close uh, survival performance so in order for us to uh, create this natural instinctive response we need to know uh, what our body requires to do that so we have to perceive something with our five senses we have to think about it and then we have to do something about it and you know in, in this context i'm talking specifically about uh, you know, or an, an instinctive reaction to a threatening scenario. Um, so again, if this startle response has brought us to a place where uh, our body is sort of, our, our, our caveman brain is taking over a little bit, some of these, you know, responses are inhibited, our perception is inhibited, our ability to think clearly about some things is inhibited, uh, we need to recognize that and we need to do things up front to, you know, train to, to overcome that because your performance in this survival incident is going to suffer when any of these things are, are disrupted. So the steps to a survival reaction, again, you have to perceive what that threat is. You have to, you know, we're all going to have to spend a second evaluating what's in front of us. And we have to formulate a response uh, and then we have to do that response so being able to train up front for as many scenarios as we can that might happen to us again you know we're, we're training for something that might never happen we're training for something that we hope never happens uh, could be one of those once in a lifetime things um, but you have to bring yourself to a place where you've been able to kind of experience that uh, in a training environment ahead of time so that you know how to react when the time comes. Um, Hicks law essentially says that your reaction time increases when a response option increases from one to two. So the idea is if we give you multiple ways to handle something, uh, the time that it takes your brain to choose from that menu of options is going to significantly decrease your reaction time. Uh, so, you know, a part of a stress inoculation concept in training is that we would try to identify situations where we can just train one option, uh, you know, the best option. I recognize that's not always uh, a, a doable thing in aviation because you know every situation is different but again like the idea of if you have a sudden loss of airspeed you should lower the nose you should push on the yoke of the stick um, you know that one option is what you're going to revert to when, when the situation becomes stressful so there are a few things that have uh, an immediate impact on the level of Activation of your sympathetic nervous system, you know, this startle response or survival response, how, you know, the level of threat as you perceive it. Uh, and I think that perception part is kind of important because, you know, somebody with multiple thousand hours of, you know, uh, backcountry flying or, or aerobatics training or something like that, you know, someone who's a very experienced aerobatic pilot who, a student or maybe themselves put them into an unintentional spin their perception of the level of threat there is going to be different than you know the the freshly uh, minted private pilot who gets into an unintentional spin is going to you know their ability to recover from that is, is potentially going to be different um, that's sort of an example of stress inoculation because those people who have that experience uh, have already experienced that situation before and they have the ability to, to instinctively react to that. How much time do you have to prepare a response? Obviously, you know, an engine failure at altitude is uh, going to probably provide less of a startle to us than 
an engine failure, you know, 100 feet or 200 feet AGL. Uh, what's your level of personal confidence? Uh, this comes from training, and this is sort of uh, the part of, you know, stress inoculation that we want to talk about. Like, you can build your personal confidence by doing appropriate training, and you build experience. Uh, and then again, you know, what, how much physical stress or survival stress for us? Again, there's not a ton of physical stress, although G-force could be looked at as physical stress. Uh, but in the airplane, you know, it's, it's more about the survival stress part of it. Uh, it's, it's certainly possible to reduce the impact of stress with immersive training. And that's sort of what we're talking about here with stress inoculation. Mindset is very important. I want to talk just briefly about, you know, how do we do this? How do we train ourselves to be inoculated to uh, survival stress in that scenario? You have to do a lot of personal uh, training on your own. I, I tell people, you know, here working at the flight school, the only person who's going to be 100% invested in your training and your you know, abilities as a pilot is you. Uh, your instructor very well may be 100% invested in it during the time that they're with you, but you're the person who has to be invested in that all the time. And so building this mindset is something that can happen sitting on the couch. It's something that can happen driving to work. It's something that can happen, you know, driving into the, to the flight lesson or whatever flight you're going to do during the day, um, you know, a commitment to completing the mission, we're talking about in this survival scenario, you have to have the commitment to seeing this through to a positive outcome. No matter what happens, you're going to fly this airplane to a safe outcome. Uh, no matter you know where you've lost the engine or what kind of mechanical failure you have or a fire or something like that, your mindset in that moment has to be that you're 100% committed to seeing this through to a positive outcome. Um, your you know, willingness to sacrifice uh, and refusal to give up is probably the most important part of that. No matter what happens, you're going to survive this scenario. And you build that into your mind from the very beginning. Um, skill selection is important as we train to deal with situations like this. Simple skills make you confident. Confident equals fear management. Again, training the caveman brain a little bit. It's the idea of training to uh, an instinctive response. Belief systems, this is sort of part of the, the mental preparedness uh, as well, you know, the, the mindset. Uh, and I touched on this again, but, you know, you, you need to be committed to seeing this through to a positive outcome. The idea of, uh, you know, this airplane is going to crash versus this is a forced landing. Uh, you know, if, if, if you, in that moment, have your mind conditioned to believe I'm going to land this airplane versus I'm going to crash this airplane, we're, we're sort of back to the idea of bang, bang, you're dead versus bang, bang, you're injured you know, seek cover, that kind of a thing. And, and that's, you know, this is one of those places where I've drawn that correlation in, in law enforcement training and, and aviation training. And then, you know, regrets and reflections are something that can increase your heart rate. There's something that can, you know, induce that stress. So, you know, if you didn't say goodbye to your husband or wife that day before you walked out to fly or you don't have your will in place or you have some, you know, personal issue that's nagging at you uh, while you're flying in that moment where now your life is on the line and you're required to, you know, focus on doing something that's potentially going to save your life or someone else's life, those things can creep into your brain and they can cause you to, you know, be focused on, on that personal refl reflection versus, you know, effectively dealing with the, the survival scenario that's in front of you. Technique confidence, um, this is sort of boils down to what we talk about with currency versus proficiency, right? Uh, you can come out and do your takeoffs and landings every 90 days in your current, but are you really a proficient pilot? Uh, you know, same thing with 
instrument flying in the clouds. You might have the rating, but you know, are you proficient enough to be flying in low IFR, uh, doing approaches to minimums and things like that? As you build your confidence, uh, as you build your proficiency, your confidence is naturally going to increase. Uh, and that instills this positive mindset. And again, we're back to the idea of attitude controlling the outcome. Um, if, if you have a, a confident attitude, a positive attitude when this happens, then you have you know, a better chance of surviving this scenario. Breath control, I like to just talk about this briefly, but when we all have that you know, startle response, it's uncontrollable that your you know, body is going to receive this jolt of energy, of adrenaline, of fear, whatever, and, and deep breathing can reduce that. Uh, this is just one breathing drill that I've been taught, you know, a very deep two count breath in through your nose, hold it for a couple of seconds and then blow out slowly through your mouth. Uh, you know, if you force yourself to do that in that moment, when the startle response is at its highest, you can, you know, physically cause your heart rate to decrease and manage that stress. And that's part of, you know, again, building in this survival response. Just a brief conversation here about the laws of learning and, and how I think those are really applicable to stress inoculation. I, I believe, this is my personal belief, that fundamentally the, the absolute most important law of learning is the law of primacy. Uh, I've seen this over and over again in both aviation and law enforcement. What you are taught the first time is what you will revert to in a stressful scenario. Um, I can guarantee that probably every one of you who are attending here today still does something that your very first CFI taught you to do in an airplane. Good, bad, or indifferent, uh, they taught you to do that and you still instinctively do that. And so, you know, we have to, as you're training to, you know, handle the survival scenario, learning it correctly the first time is, is the most important. And so, you know, I would say seek out instructors, seek out, um, you know, pilots to train with who you believe have the ability and the experience to provide that correct instruction to you the first time. Another part of stress inoculation, this is really important, is, you know, doing something vividly or dramatic or exciting. It needs to be intense training because this, again, this scenario may never happen to you, um, but we're training to the idea of trying to experience it in a safe environment as much as we can. Um, so the more that you can try and create intense and vivid training, especially for your CFIs who are listening, you know, as you're providing training to your students specific to dealing with emergencies, find a creative way to make that vivid, uh, to make that something that they're not going to forget and to also make it so that if they do deal with that scenario in, in, you know, a real life scenario, they have develop some experience in handling that. There, it, it's important to, you know, raise the heart rate a little bit, raise the adrenaline level a little bit in training so that we've been exposed to that. Recency, again, you know, proficiency versus um, currency, you need to be, you know, doing these things most recently. Those are things that you're going to, you know, employ when, when you're not thinking about it and in, in, in instinctive reaction. Um, and again, you know, readiness exercise effect to me is really important here that as you train, you have to train through to a positive outcome every time. If you're doing an engine failure drill, you know, obviously we're not going to go land in the cornfield that we've identified as our best field, but there is a way that you can follow that through as an instructor or as a student you know, to, to follow that through to a positive outcome, even if that's just having a discussion in the post-flight about, okay, we've landed in the cornfield, now what are we gonna do? How are we gonna follow this through? You know, how do we secure the airplane? How are we gonna get help? Um, you know, visualizing things 
through to a positive outcome each time. Um, so, you know, to, to kind of wrap this up here a little bit, how do we apply this? How do we follow through with inoculating ourselves to this survival stress scenario? Visualization exercises, I think, are really important. Chair flying, um, you know, again, driving to work and just thinking it through. In law enforcement, many times we're driving around in the middle of the night. We tell trainees, think about what you're going to do. Visualize that you're responding to a loud party call. And when you show up at the house and you go and knock on the door, the person answers the door with a shotgun uh, or the person runs out the back door and just, you know, as, as vividly as you can, visualize yourself responding to that scenario because you can train your brain without ever having been in this kind of scenario. You can visualize that, put yourself in that world, and, and you know, it's, it's nearly as effective. Vicarious learning, I know David touched a little bit on YouTube. When I talk about YouTube here, I'm talking about the, the good parts. Uh, I think that there's a lot of stuff out there where you can, uh, you know, learn vicariously through, well, and, and maybe vicarious learning of what not to do as well, but, uh, you know, watching these videos, seeing other pilots fly, I think this is, you know, some, some parts of YouTube can be great for perfecting, you know, radio communication, you listen to people you know, professional pilots who are flying in the system all day and, you know, watch a full flight with them and hear how they communicate. You're learning that just as they learned it in that moment. Uh, I think we all like the Air Safety Institute videos, you know, uh, looking at crash analysis and trying to prevent ourselves from getting into these scenarios, learning from the mistakes of others. That's what we're talking about here with vicarious learning. Role-playing survival scenarios, again, this is something you can do, you know, with your instructor. You can do it on your own. Uh, you can, you know, create, uh, write down a couple of survival scenarios on a piece of paper and take them flying with you and just pull one out of the hat and, you know, role-play that in the air or on the ground. Um, probably, I think, one of the most useful tools for this is immersive simulation. Um, we have you know, simulators out there that are very high tech now uh, where you can create just about any kind of scenario that you would look for to train in this. Uh, the Redbird full motion simulators, we have one here at Rochester Air Center. Uh, you know, even your home flight simulator, you can, you know, build a scenario into that simulator that's going to test your ability to deal with this life-threatening scenario. And by virtue of doing that, you're inoculating yourself to, you know, the stress that's going to happen when you happen to deal with that in real life. And finally, just repetitious practice, you know, engine out drills, go arounds, uh, those kinds of things. You, you get in the airplane with your instructor and you go out and you do it over and over and over again. Uh, correctly, of course, building that primacy so that when, you know, the scenario happens, your reaction is really instinctive that you have a correct reaction instinctively and you follow that through to a positive outcome. And that is the end of that. All right. Thank you. Um, Ace, that was a, that was excellent. Excellent. I'm taking the controls back here and, and there we have it. Uh, I think there's just one question here that, is appropriate for everybody and I got to find it again this is about a two-point font so bear with me on these um, um, oh, one personal challenge is that emergency practice can really be realistic as I know with an instructor that it is practice oh, it can't really be realistic what are your thoughts on simulators with random failures as a way to more realis realistically mimic the oh crap moment that would really occur? I, I think it's fantastic. Um, and I, I probably didn't get into this as much as I would have liked. I'm watching the time here a little bit, but you know, we do an engine failure drill, for instance, and you know, you do this with an instructor over and over again, and it becomes okay, the instructor pulls the power to idle and you go, oh gosh, we've lost the engine. What are we going to do? You don't build in that, you know, charge that you're going to feel when that really happens. And so I think for instructors, 
any way that they can, you know, increase that level of adrenaline a little bit, even if that's to do this engine failure drill at a time when it's really inopportune in the airplane, you know, uh, maybe bringing the airplane into, you know, a slow flight condition and then inducing a, a stall or something, you know, you can brainstorm those ideas and find a safe way, again, like David talked about, leaving yourself an out uh, to, to charge that up a little bit when you do that practice in the airplane. But obviously, there's only a certain, you know, point that we can take that to because we have to maintain uh, the safety of the flight. The simulator is a fantastic place to do that. The simulator is a great place to create that scenario, and it's also a place where you can charge things up a little bit. Your instructor can charge things up a little bit. I mean, you know, you can get out of the simulator and do 20 jumping jacks to increase your heart rate a little bit and then get in and do that engine out or you know, VFR and IMC scenario and the simulator so that you've, you've built up a little bit of what you're going to experience when that happens. So okay. I hope that answered that. Yeah, great. Ace, uh, we got, we're, I knew you are correct, we're running a little bit behind on the time, but um, lots of compliments on your presentation here, and I will send you some other questions that came in. Maybe you can answer them individually. Um, yeah. This this one uh, I have to share, <laughs> this one says, uh, it's from Peter, he says, I wish I'd heard this presentation before I flew combat missions over Iraq. Great stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm, right. I'm sorry I didn't get it to you before then, Peter, but I'm glad you're home. Thanks for your service. All right. Thank you, Ace. That was that was great. We'll move on here. Uh, New York Jet at Iceclip MacArthur Airport through its operating company Mid-Island Air Service sets the standard for total FBO service with our professional and personal services offering full concierge needs from catering, hotel, and car rentals to our corporate, business, and private pilots. Visit us at newyorkjet.com or 631-588-5400. And we thank them for their sponsorship of this event. And we have a poll. This is a poll that was submitted by ACE. And I bear with me as I find my controls again here. Okay. And we'll launch it. And while we're launching that, we'll limit this one to 30 seconds. But um, I'm going to just tell Ace while we're doing this that um, I apologize. I, when you submitted your question, I didn't realize that there was a limit to the number of text characters allowed. So I had to edit a little bit to get it down. I think we still uh, met the, got, got the concept in here pretty well. All right, we're at 25 seconds. Uh, trying to see what percentage when we have 60% of the people voted. Okay, going to close the poll in five, four, three, two, one. Numbers are still coming in. I'll give it just a couple seconds. Okay, close the poll and share the poll. Yeah, overwhelmingly, 61% uh, think that uh, they would benefit from uh, that sort of training. All right, thank you very much we appreciate that fantastic all right moving along uh, we want to thank our sponsor pilot to pilot.com for their support pilots you can reduce your cost of flying fly with another pilot post your flights and view posted flights in your area by joining pilot to pilot.com i joined it looks like a pretty good process and uh there's one more poll here that Ace sent. We do have time to do that. We're going to make time to do that because I think these are important. And launch the poll. Do you believe aviation stress inoculation training could help you become a better prepared to react to an in-flight emergency? Yes, no, or not sure. Wow. <laughs> you really sold them on this, Ace, uh, <laughs> by the numbers I'm seeing coming in. 65% have voted, and we're going to close the poll in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, close, and share. I think you uh, um, you better go sell cars or something here, Ace, because uh, there's more money in it, I think. Uh, this is uh, th that's fantastic. You really, uh, you really sold them on that. Let's talk about putting a program together. It sounds, uh, sounds like what's something that we should probably do. Okay, Westchester Aviation Association, that's your voice at the Westchester County Airport. 
They're an enthusiastic group of aviation professionals. You can join them at westchesteraviation.org. Check them out. We appreciate their sponsorship. And running a little bit late, but up next we are proud to have Adam Rosenberg. Adam is a major airline captain on the A320. He's a Czech airman on that. He's also an FAA designated pilot examiner. I know at least one of our other presenters coming up later took his check ride from, uh, from Adam, he said. Adam has done many live presentations as part of the FAA safety team while he can, continues to perform his airline and DPE roles. Adam's presentation is titled Scenario-Based Training for Abnormals and Emergencies. That is also a subject that is very dear to my heart. So, Adam, we're going to hand you the controls. Adam, you have the controls. I see your mic is muted. I can't unmute it. Adam, are you there? Adam, I see that you're on. There we go. Your mic is still muted, Adam. Testing, testing, testing. Still showing a muted mic, Adam. And I can't unmute it. How about now? There you go. We're seeing your screen. You just need to run Hello, it, but everybody. we're getting your audio. All right. Let's try this. All right. What do we all see? My presentation view? Your, your, your whole screen uh, with, with all the slides down the side and the one in the middle. You need to click run the presentation, I believe. How's that look? That's much better. Still getting slides down at the bottom. There we go. Bingo. We are there. You are all right. cleared, for, cleared for takeoff. All right. Thank you, Gene. Very much appreciated. Uh, welcome to the Virtual Aviation Safety Stand Down. I am humbled by the amount of participants on board today, and I'm honored to be speaking with all of you. Prior to the pandemic, I conducted many safety seminars in the New York metro area. I have recently relocated to Charlotte, North Carolina, and I'm anxious to begin my live in-person seminars when it is safe for us to do so. In the interim, these webinars are a great way to get the message out to a broader and more geographically diverse audience. I look forward to accomplishing more of these in the future. Uh, ACE's webinar was a great segue into my discussion today. I'll start the webinar with a quote from one of my favorite books, Fate is the Hunter by Ernest K. Gann. The official verdict was pilot error, but since their passengers, who were innocent of the controls, also failed to survive, it seemed that fate was the hunter, as it had been and would be. What this means is that as aviators, we have a duty and responsibility to be prepared for the ultimate check ride, the one we don't know is coming and what it will entail. Every flight we take is a check ride. The only question is, who is doing the examining? Chances are the most difficult check ride you will ever take will not be with a representative of the FAA on board. It will be with the most precious of cargo, and they will be relying on your training and professionalism for survival. Aviation has inherent risks, which must be recognized, accepted, and managed to an acceptable level. In some of the earliest days of aviation, former Pan Am pilot and founder of Flight Safety International, A.L. Yulchi, famously said that the best safety device in any cockpit is a well-trained pilot. Those words are still true today. No one is born knowing how to be a good pilot. We must learn these skills from others that have learned them before us. I have learned much from the many intrepid aviators I have had the honor to fly with over the decades. Instructing, examining, and conducting seminars and webinars like these are my opportunity to give back and honor them the ones, the pilots that came before me, by passing on the knowledge I collected from them. I do it with the hope that one day you will all do the same. There are two different philosophies in flight training today, training people to be good pilots and training people to pass tests. If you train people to be good pilots, they will have no problem passing tests. 
if you train people to pass tests, they may or may not become good pilots. As an Airbus Czech Airman for American Airlines, and with more than a decade of experience, <clears throat> excuse me, as an FAA designated pilot examiner, it is difficult for me to see different pilots repeat the same mistakes. A number of years ago, I made the conscious decision to go beyond just making a binary pass-fail determination and call upon my training and experience as a 121 Czech Airman in order to help improve the quality of training in general aviation. I modified the five-point grading scale used in the airlines and retooled all of my check ride plans of action to start collecting data, which I would then enter into a de-identified database that I would use to analyze statistically significant trends and training deficiencies. The data I collected turned out to be priceless and revealed much about the state of general aviation training and even speaks volumes about the individual collecting the data as well. I use the data to adjust how I evaluate applicants and can even see within my data set when I've been gouged on scenarios. A few years ago, I shared my data with the uh, New York General Aviation community that I collected on. That seminar was entitled Confessions of a DPE. One of the statistically significant spikes identified by my data was that abnormals and emergencies were being trained ineffectively and only in a compartmentalized and linear fashion tailored to pass a test. While I see some subtle variations in other maneuvers and tasks, this one always is the standout. This prompted me years ago to do a comprehensive fast team seminar on the topic, and this webinar is a scaled down version of that seminar. Tied in with this is the human factor component, in which I did another seminar where I discuss and explain in graphic detail how the mind of a pilot works on a psychological level, dissecting it into the flight phases and further breaking it down to the steps within a maneuver. These are just a few example slides from my human factors presentation. In December of 1854, Louis Pasteur said that in the field of observation, chance favors the prepared mind. What this meant to Pasteur was that scientists should not condition themselves to only observe predetermined outcomes of their experiments. Some of the most consequential scientific breakthroughs occurred while scientists found something other than what they were originally looking for. This wasn't the result of chance as the quote may suggest. It was the result of intentional preparation, discipline, and conditioning. While it would be another half a century before man took to the air, Pasteur's quote has significant application to the mind of a pilot tasked with flying a complex machine at high speed through an ever-changing environment. This requires the pilot to have a prepared mind in order to detect, assess, and react to the myriad of changing conditions that could be encountered during flight and be prepared to take decisive action based on constantly changing input. This graphic typifies a common training event for a simulated engine failure followed by a series of memorized actions. Aircraft maneuvering to a point where a landing would be reasonably well assured followed by a climb back to a safe altitude. While this type of training has some value, it falls short of teaching the airman the purpose of the memorized actions and how to react if one of them is successful at restoring engine power. It also does little to teach the aviator how to sequence together a series of end result oriented actions while remaining vigilant for potential alternate paths to resolution. What if during the memorized actions, the activation of the electric fuel pump restored engine power. The remaining checklist actions would need not be accomplished. This situation should now be managed as an aeronautical decision-making exercise, recognizing that fuel starvation was most likely caused by a malfunctioning engine-driven fuel pump. You are now operating on the redundant backup that is reliant on the normal operation of the electrical system in order to maintain sustained engine power. 
the best decision to make in this scenario is to notify air traffic control, declare pan pan three times, and divert to the nearest suitable airport. A pilot is akin to an actor in a movie, and good actors rehearse their lines before going on set. In Hollywood, if an actor makes a mistake, the director yells cut and the film the scene again. Unfortunately, as pilots, we aren't afforded that luxury. We need to get the scene right on the very first and only take. Therefore, it is incumbent upon us to rehearse our lines keeping in mind that accuracy takes precedence over speed. Nowhere is this more important than in the handling of an unexpected event like a go-around, wind shear, terrain encounter, or an abnormal or emergency that has memory actions associated with it. Many pilots are visual learners. A model such as this can aid in teaching the fine art of workflow development and task prioritization, which is the concept of sequencing together the items that need to be accomplished within a hierarchy of importance. Using a flowchart can aid the pilot in efficiently moving from task to task without spending time thinking about which one comes next or the order that they should be accomplished. So how do we get from where we are to where we want to be? We begin by implementing a strategy of systems integration training, which is a vertically integrated, bottom-up training methodology using a combination of documents to include the pilot's handbook of aeronautical knowledge, airplane flying handbook, aircraft-specific pilot's operating handbook, and checklists. We begin our journey to becoming better pilots. We start with the system functions, associated limitations, components, and controls, normal operation and indications, abnormal operations and indications, checklists, decision-making processes, and any follow-up items, checklists, or procedures. This component of the training is best learned using a combination of self-study and one-on-one -on -one classroom guided instruction. After completing the self-study and classroom for all of the systems of your aircraft, we are ready to take on the tabletop exercises similar to the engine-driven fuel pump failure discussed earlier. All scenarios begin with an event trigger, which needs to be as realistic as possible and tailored to the aircraft you are training in. This trigger could be as simple as illumination of an enunciator light. Once the trigger has been simulated, it should prompt the pilot to run the script. After tabletop exercising all the abnormal and emergency checklists for your aircraft, you are now ready to add the real-time element of validating them in a simulator or aircraft. You are rolling down the runway on an IFR flight with low ceilings and visibility. You rotate at 65 knots. As you start your climb and scan your instruments, you observe that your altimeter is frozen and your vertical speed is zero. What is wrong and what do you do? Observe how the question is framed. It is a chronological timeline of events and observed indications. What we want to have happen is for the pilot to answer the question in the same way, picking up where the question left off. Identify the problem, initiate an action, followed by making a decision. On a rote level, I find that many instrument pilot candidates and even flight instructor instrument airplane candidates can draw the pedostatic system from memory and discuss the failures and associated indications in great detail. But when framing the question in a scenario, many have difficult time formulating a cogent answer in the safety and sanctity of a briefing room. Merely knowing what the abnormal indications are just isn't enough. A well-formulated answer to my original question should go something to the effect of, I'm going to maintain a known climb pitch attitude and continue climbing. 
I have a block static port, so I'm going to actuate the alternate static source, which should then give me usable indications. I continue flying the airplane, notify air traffic control, and request return to my airport of departure or another nearby suitable airport. Using scenario-based questions like these and helping pilots formulate the correct answers will help them reach the correlative level of knowledge. This is where they can apply what they have learned to real-world situations that they may face someday. The goal being, if this happens to them, they will be able to fall back on the training that they received rather than having to take their knowledge and train themselves on how to use it at a time when they can least afford to do so. Emergency Descent. The Airplane Flying Handbook and ACS, Airman Certification Standards, treat the emergency descent as another compartmentalized task without a realistic beginning or end. It is in essence a series of rote memorized actions that are accomplished, terminated at a predetermined altitude, followed by a climb back to a safe altitude. While the task in the ACS must be trained to proficiency and evaluated, it is best to train beyond what the ACS requires because a real emergency descent is much more complex than any FAA handbook or study guide would have you believe. It is in essence a decision making, task loading, and time management exercise all rolled into one. Training emergency descents is accomplished by using a triggering event by which the pilot then formulates an end result and to that end determines the best procedure to apply to get from where they are to where they want to be. Examples of triggering events could be a loss of pressurization, engine fire, electrical smoke, fire, fumes, carbon monoxide, or an incapacitated passenger. This is not an all-inclusive list, and there are numerous other reasons as well, but these are a good start in order to exercise your decision-making, task loading, and time management abilities. Ultimately, we want to get to the point where we can think about the trigger, the end result, and then execute a linear order of operations that will get us to the desired end result using a flow chart similar to the one on your screen. Let's go over a few examples. An electrical fire is identified by an acrid odor and depending on the severity may also be accompanied by white or gray smoke. If your aircraft has a checklist that addresses electrical fires, use it to try and isolate the cause. If your airplane does not have a checklist for this malfunction, start with circulation and or cooling fans or simply shut off all electrical items. If the smoke or fire subsides, proceed to the nearest suitable airport at a high forward speed respecting aircraft and pilot limitations and perform a normal landing. If the smoke or fire is not extinguished, perform a maximum rate emergency descent and consider an off airport landing. Remember that if you shut off all or part of your electrical system, you may not be able to transmit to air traffic control. If you suspect exposure to carbon monoxide due to a heater malfunction, immediately shut off the heater and open all fresh air vents that come through the wings and not through the engine cowling or firewall. Use oxygen if available. Open windows respecting aircraft limitations and proceed to the nearest suitable airport at a high forward speed respecting aircraft and pilot limitations. Declare an emergency with air traffic control, request medical attention upon arrival, and perform a normal landing. If you have a gravely ill passenger, proceed to the nearest, nearest suitable airport at a high forward speed, respecting aircraft and pilot limitations. Declare an emergency with ATC, request medical assistance. Be prepared to forward to them as much information as you can about the ill passenger to include 
their age, gender, symptoms, any known pre-existing conditions, and whether they are conscious or unconscious. This information prepares first responders to administer immediate first aid upon your arrival. If you were to experience an engine fire, run your aircraft's emergency checklist with immediate action items, which will have you attempt to extinguish the fire by shutting down the engine. This is accomplished by shutting off the fuel and cutting the mixture. If the fire persists, descend at a high airspeed in an attempt to create an incombustible mixture, which will hopefully extinguish the fire. Once the fire is extinguished, now transition to best glide and continue with an off airport forced landing. This is one of the more complex procedures to manage because of the changing dynamics and the need to stitch together many checklists and procedures to include engine fire, forced landing, power off 180, slip to landing, off airport soft landing, followed by an evacuation. That's a lot of ACS tasks to sequence together, but that is ultimately why we train them all. The only way to get competent and confident is to practice all of these skills often. When students ask, why do I need to learn all of these tasks that they think they'll never use, I give them this example. FAR 91.3 gives the pilot command final authority and allows him to deviate, or her, to deviate from any regulation or clearance to the extent necessary to meet the demands of the emergency and see it through to a successful outcome. An emergency may be declared by anyone involved to include the pilot, an air traffic controller, or dispatcher in commercial operations. You can rarely be faulted for declaring an emergency but you can be faulted for not declaring an emergency when you should have. Aviate, navigate, communicate in that order and make sure you have done everything you need to do for the safety of your occupants and that they have all been accomplished prior to initiating contact with their traffic control and never worry about any reports you think you may have to file. That takes up valuable brain power that you need to manage your emergency situation. You can explain your actions and decisions after it's all over. Be prepared to relay the nature of the emergency, souls on board, and fuel in hours and minutes to air traffic and in gallons or pounds to crash fire rescue personnel on tower or CTAF frequency. If you are busy dealing with an aircraft related issue or checklist, don't hesitate to just say, stand by. Air traffic controllers are trained to know that you may be under a high workload and will give you time to get done what you need to do. They are there to assist you in any way they can. Give them as much information as you can, but only as your time and workload permits. The more information you can offer, the better but don't let it distract you from your primary task, which is to fly the airplane and run appropriate checklists and make good decisions. When communicating, use the clearest possible language, keeping in mind that they may or may not know certain aircraft-specific acronyms or systems descriptions. For instance, say I have had a failure of my primary flight instruments rather than saying my PFD failed. Mayday, mayday, mayday is the universally recognized phrase for an aircraft in distress as outlined in the Aeronautical Information Manual 6-3-1. The phrase is an adaptation of a French phrase which means help me. Also mentioned in AIM 6-3-1 is the use of the phrase pan pan which means breakdown. This would be used for an aircraft that requires urgent handling but falls short of being 
an aircraft in distress. An example on how to use these would be an alternator failure in VFR day conditions. I would consider that to be a pan-pan, where the same failure at night, or IFR, I would classify as a mayday. Another example would be an engine failure to a forced landing is clearly a mayday. But if engine power were restored and you were diverting to the nearest suitable airport, then that would be a pan-pan. The level of emergency and level of assistance desired is always at the discretion of the pilot in command. It's your call to make. My examples are exactly that, just examples. The nearest suitable airport isn't necessarily where your car is parked or where your mechanic is located. It may also not be the nearest airport, and it may also be behind you. Take the following attributes into consideration when determining your diversionary airport. Distance and time, runway length and direction, weather and wind, instrument approach availability, control tower availability, crash fire rescue, and proximity to a hospital for medical reasons or possible injuries. When choosing a site for an off-airport landing, we need to run through a hierarchy of desirable attributes all centered around survivability. Size, surface, wind direction, obstacles, and proximity to first responders are all items to consider. If a choice of surfaces are available, rank them in the following order. Paved, grass, hard sand, soft sand. From there, factor in the length. A mile-long empty sod field is more desirable than 1,000 feet of pavement with trees at either end. If you make a good landing, your ELT won't activate, so you'll have to activate it manually to aid first responders in locating you. The vertically integrated method of systems integration training and decision making will make you feel more confident in your ability to handle emergency or an abnormal situation. The question of what do I do now becomes, I've seen this before and I know exactly what to do. Make your next hour flying better than your last. That means to do my job for me and be your own examiner. Use some self-reflection to judge your own performance against the standard and make continuous improvements by reflecting back on your experience. Seek intensive recurrent training, not just a CFI friend who is going to go easy on you. Learn from multiple flight instructors and take check rides with multiple examiners. If you only learn flying from one person, you will get all of their good habits, all of their bad habits, and won't have the ability to differentiate between the two. Choose solid aviation role models to emulate as you progress through your aviation life and career. Be an ambassador for aviation and make sure that the people you take flying with you want to go flying again. They might just become a future student pilot because of their experience and interaction with you. Finally, safety is a relatively thankless job because we only hear about our failures and never know about our successes. The accident that we prevented never makes it into the headlines. I'd like to thank everyone for tuning in today and making our industry a safer place. Stay safe out there and I look forward to seeing you all in person. Adam, thank you very much. That was a great, great presentation. I'm taking the controls back here, and there we go. We only had one uh, question came up relating to your presentation, and since we're running short on time, and it's probably best that it's answered individually, got a lot of uh, positive comments coming, a lot of compliments. Only one question. I will send that to you, and maybe you can answer that one uh, directly. So. Thank you very much, Adam. We appreciate your time today and, and sharing your expertise with us. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. You are very welcome. We appreciate it.
In case you didn't know, Avemco is a sponsor of the FAST team and pays for the wings that we receive when we complete a phase of wings. We appreciate their sponsorship. Uh, the Westchester Aviation Association is your voice at the Westchester County Airport. We're an enthusiastic group of aviation professionals. Please join us at westchesteraviation.org. Always wanted to learn to fly? Avia Flight Academy, your ultimate flight school in Connecticut, offering all pilot ratings, first flight experiences, and Young Aviator Academy for Teens. Dream big with us and learn to fly in a safe and fun environment using the latest digital technology to enhance your learning experiences. Visit us at aviaflightacademy.com. And again, Pilot to Pilot, we want to thank them for their uh, sponsorship, pilottopilot.com. Pilots, you can reduce your cost of flying, fly with another pilot. It's also, um, you know, a learning experience, too. I totally support it. Post your flights and view posted flights in your area by joining pilottopilot.com. Uh, aircraft Specialty Services is your one-stop shop for general aviation. If you need new parts, our knowledgeable and friendly sales staff is here to meet your needs. Don't forget to ask about special pricing for our machine shop customers. Call today and let Aircraft Specialty Services exceed your expectations. Aircraftspecialties.aero. And next up, we have Toby Bukchescu. Toby has combined 11 years experience as an FAA air traffic control specialist at the Boston Air Route Traffic Control Center and the New York Terminal Approach Control. He received his private pilot certificate in 2018. He also maintains a great YouTube channel you might want to check out. Um, the uh, YouTube channel is kind of long, if you, if you Google him and search it for him on uh, YouTube, I'm sure you will find it. I can't really read the, uh, <laughs> the URL here, you wouldn't be able to get it anyway. Um, his presentation today is titled, We're in this together, building your confidence when talking with ATC. All right, Toby, I'm going to change possession, presenters sure. and yeah. And, and there we go. And Toby, you have the controls, sir. Now I have the controls and I yes. want to show my main screen. You see you. And I want to and there's your screen. over to Keynote. Everybody can see that? We can. At least I can. <laughs> Fantastic. I appreciate the opportunity to present. Thank you, Gene. Thank you, Adam, for that great presentation and for passing me on my check ride. Um, I was pretty nervous going into that, but Adam uh, definitely is, is a fun person to get a check ride from. I, I've, like I said, I had 11 years about working as a controller. I worked in Area A of Boston Center. That's the western portion over Syracuse and uh, all the way up to the Canadian border in Albany, that area. Then I transferred down to New York TRACON, which has five areas of specialization, and I worked in the LaGuardia area. We'll dive into that a little bit more in a minute, but uh, LaGuardia handles... Obviously, LaGuardia arrivals and departures, Westchester County Airport arrival and departures, and then the Danbury Airport as well. So I'm going to talk about VFR and IFR operations. We'll start with VFR. Obviously, this is the New York class Bravo, and I'm not going to talk about the Hudson River exclusion or the Skyline route. I think that's well-worn territory. If you have questions specifically about that, you can feel free to ask at the end. But I want to talk more about this uh, idea of just transitioning the airspace at altitude rather than going around. I'm under the impression there's a lot of pilots who will go around because either they lack the confidence to engage ATC and ask for permission, or they think that they're a nuisance if they do and they fly around. And um, just as a little snarky side note, you're just as much of a nuisance flying right along the edge of the Bravo as you are being in the Bravo. Um, and so, not that you're a nuisance, but the point being, I'm happy to give you a Bravo clearance. Most of my coworkers are, excuse me, and um, my IFR jets, you're still in the way if you're just outside the Bravo versus being in the Bravo. The only difference is obviously I'm providing you more of a service. And um, so keeping the transitioning the airspace concept really, really simple, just giving you a general rule that if you're at 5,500 or 6,500, you're probably going to get your Bravo clearance, direct your destination through the Bravo without much of a hassle. Um, most departures coming off the major airports are climbing to 5,000 feet or below. 
Um, so if you're transitioning at 55 or 65 and we don't care about right altitude for direction of flight, we just put you at the altitude that is best for us, you'll be able to fly from point A to point B through the Bravo at 5,500 feet or 6,500 feet. And you might get a turn or two um, if we need it. And I'll show that in more detail in a second. But this next slide is an important concept that I think most of you probably understand, but I know that there are pilots who don't understand it based on the way that they talk to me on the radios. And that is for you to separate in your mind completely the class Bravo airspace and the controller's airspace because they are not the same thing. Uh, again, I have numerous pilots who are, are chugging along. I hope you can see my cursor. They're flying in the Bravo 5,500 feet. Maybe they're going to Bridgeport or points northeast and they get to the edge of the Bravo and they say, oh, we can terminate now. We're leaving your airspace. Well, yeah, you can terminate if you want. I'm more than happy to terminate you, but you're not leaving my airspace. Uh, in this case, this map, what we call a video map, is displaying the LaGuardia specializations only, uh, airspace only. So that's what I control as the LaGuardia controller. It's usually split into up to six different radar positions. Um, if it's super busy, usually four or five. But anyway, you're still in my airspace. My airspace doesn't really correlate to the Class Bravo at all. But obviously, when you're up in here, you don't have to be talking to me. And when you get down into the Bravo, you do. Uh, that's Westchester, just for reference here, so you understand Westchester County Airport, LaGuardia right there in the middle, Kennedy, Newark. This is taken when it's really, really, really slow on a midnight shift. So it would normally be completely covered in green dots. Over here on the right, you're just sort of seeing the, uh, the Kennedy, LaGuardia, and Newark airspace is sort of juxtaposed. It's, it's a three-dimensional jigsaw puzzle. In this case, Kennedy owns on top of LaGuardia here, and LaGuardia owns on top of Newark here, and LaGuardia owns on top. Just understand that none of our airspace has anything really to do with the class Bravo. The Bravo just tells you where you can't go without permission, but it doesn't correlate directly to my airspace. Um, so even if you're outside the Bravo, you're still in my airspace or someone else's airspace. Here's just um, quick examples of transitioning the uh, Bravo. So LaGuardia is right in the middle. This is only showing you LaGuardia departures off of runway 13. And I'm not going to dive too deep into the weeds, but we have different departure procedures off runway 13. And you'll see that in a moment. But in this case, this is called the tennis climb. They fly straight ahead and they make a left turn. This is the, these are the departures off LaGuardia. There's the Throgs Neck Bridge right there. Now, if you're flying this southern red line, the one that passes just south of LaGuardia at 5,500 feet, you're not in my way at all. You see the sort of color codes here. These aircraft, as they're climbing, they're climbing to 5,000 and they're clearance off the ground. And it's right around here, just east of the Throgs Neck Bridge, that these aircraft are going to break that 5,000 foot and they're going to keep climbing. So if you're on this southern line, you're not in the way. Sorry, excuse me. But if you are just five miles to the north, if you're just on this line at 5,500 feet, now you're right in this hot spot. You're right in the way where these aircraft are going to climb through 5,000 feet. So what am I going to do? Well, A, you're at 5,500 feet, so I could just leave you there and not climb my LaGuardia departures. I'll just leave them at 5,000 feet until they're clear. The other option, if I'm really busy and I know I have a lot of departure demand, I don't want these guys to level off, I'm going to turn you. I'm either going to turn you left until you're down here, and again, this is Kennedy right here, and then I'll give you direct your destination, or I'll turn you up here and then on course. Either way, I'm just moving you out of this hot spot. That's where I don't want you, and it it, it shouldn't be a concern of yours. You shouldn't think, where's the hot spot? I'll show you in a minute that they're constantly moving depending on runway configura configurations. But the point is, don't overthink it. If you want to fly through the Bravo at 5,500 feet, just ask. 65, just ask. Becomes a little more of a problem if you're landing, for example, at Caldwell or Morristown over here and you want a, a Bravo clearance of 5,500 feet. And now, you know, once you're here, you have to descend and Newark's not going to be too happy about that with their flow. So if you're landing in an airport that's underneath a Bravo shelf, then you might get more vectors. You might be told to remain outside. But if you're just transitioning, there's nothing to be afraid of. Here's the same departure runway, still departing runway 13 at LaGuardia. Oh, we're doing the Whitestone climb now that involves a right turn off the runway and then a left turn. You can see the hot spot, the point, well, in this case, it's showing 4,000 feet. But the point where aircraft are breaking 5,000 feet has moved south. Now this southern line is where I don't want you. And now the northern line is where I do want you. So I'm going to move you over there if I have to. Or again, I'll just let you fly straight ahead and I'll stop my departures at 5,000 underneath you. 
I don't want you to overthink this. I'm just trying to give you a, a broad rule about, uh, you know, good altitudes, 55 and above. Again, the Bravo only goes to seven. You can obviously fly over the top of it at 7,500 feet all you want or higher. This is the uh, same situation, different runway, 31. Departing 31, there's the George Washington Bridge. These aircraft are breaking that four or 5,000 foot altitude just north of the George Washington Bridge along the Hudson River. So now the hotspot move. Now the hotspot's over here instead of over here. And I'm just going to move you onto a line that I like um, if I have to, if I have a lot of demand. So don't overthink it. Just ask for what you want and then expect a vector if we need to. And, you know, you all should be able to fly a heading in an altitude assigned by ATC if that's what's concerning you, that you wouldn't be able to comply with an ATC instruction, then that's a different concern and talk to your instructor about that. But I'm going to move on from VFR operations because I really do consider them to be simple. Just ask for what you want and then, you know, we'll give it to you or we'll have to tweak it a little bit. Um, but IFR operations are, are a little different and this is not a hypothetical situation I'm about to play out for you. This is very real. Um, it's happened to me multiple times working, but uh, aircraft on the ground at Farmingdale, in this case, a Cirrus wants to fly IFR to Allentown. And he realizes, or maybe he files something different, but he's issued this routing, Bridgeport, Sparta, Victor 249, Victor 30, I'm sorry, Victor 249, Solberg, Victor 30, East Texas. That's it. That's your only option if you're on the ground at Farmingdale and you want to fly IFR to Allentown. Um, you're not going to get... Uh, Another, there might be a route out over the water. Um, I'm not aware of it, and I don't think any singles are going to fly it. So this is what you have to do. And on a regular basis, well, regular basis, I've experienced it twice in six years. I'm sure some of my coworkers have experienced it a few times. The pilot says, you know what? I, I'm, it's a beautiful day. I'm going to take off Farmingdale. They climb above the Bravo at 8,500 feet, and they come right in here, and they say, now I want to pick my IFR up to Allentown. And you know, they didn't want to fly all the way up here, and I get that. And if you do this on a bluebird day, which the example I'm talking about now, it was a gorgeous day, um, there's really not a danger involved in that. But you, you, if, if you do it on a day where you think you get over here, you're going to require your IFR clearance. That's, you know, you're going to demand it because the clouds. Um, now you're, you're getting into a, a difficult situation. So I'm going to talk about the difficulty of issuing your IFR, you, your IFR clearance in this location right here, which is just, you know, south, southeast of Solberg right here. So here's that LaGuardia video map again, um, the, the airspace that I'm responsible for working in the LaGuardia specialization. Here's Farmingdale, and in white is the IFR route. The yellow, orange arrow points to Solberg. And the dashed line represents what the VFR pilot did, climbed 8,500 feet, clear the Bravo, and still on a 1,200 code, which is totally fine, calls me actually a little south of the line, so right in here. These green lines represent LaGuardia arrivals, and this airspace down here to the southwest is what we call the Empire position. And the Empire's position's only job is to sequence two flows of LaGuardia arrivals, one from New York Center, you get fed at 10,000 feet here, and one from Washington Center at 10,000 feet. You can see all the all the heavy lifting, all the work is done right in here. And I only own. Uh, you got to understand there. Uh, sometimes this airspace is very cut up. In here, I only own 10,000 feet. It's the only altitude which I am responsible for. Um, and underneath me is the Newark controller at 9,000 with um, Teterboro arrivals being fed here, and this is Yardley and Newark arrivals being fed here at nine, descending to eight. So there's a lot happening underneath me, but I only own one altitude. And then as I get in here, I only own nine and eight. I'm sorry, uh, 10 and nine, and then 10, nine and eight, and then 10, nine, seven. So like a staircase stepping down, but I don't have a lot of airspace. And here you are at 8,500 feet, and you say, hey, New York, uh, one, two, three, four. All right, go ahead, November one, two, three, four. Yeah, I want to pick my IFR up to Allentown. Well, two things. One, I don't have paperwork on that. This guy does up here. He has all that paperwork, but I don't have it. So I have to either go to the computer myself and get it, or I have to say to my supervisor, hey, can you get me paperwork on this guy? Now I get your paperwork. And you're cruising along in your Cirrus. You know, you're doing 160 knots or whatever you're going to do. And you're not far from the edge of my airspace at 8,500 feet where you're going to end up in the newer controller. I don't have time, right, to evaluate 
whether or not I can give you this IFR clearance. I have to call Newark. I have to, first of all, make you visible on the Newark controller. Then I have to call them. And I'm busy. I'm vectoring and sequencing all these LaGuardia arrivals. And they're doing just the same thing, except they're doing it at 8,000, 9,000 down here. And the answer is, in this, in, in this real-world situation, the answer was, we're not giving you your IFR. Thank God it's a, it's a gorgeous bluebird day, but just continue westbound at, at 8,500 feet, and it may be, maybe you'll get your IFR clearance from Allentown. On this next slide, uh, I'm going to show you the same lines and everything, but now it's the Newark arrival flows. You're not even seeing the Teterboro flows in here, but now it's the Newark arrival flows, which are, they're crossing Yardley at 9 and 8, descending in here and getting sequenced and vectored in here. So this is happening directly underneath this. Um, and then the Newark departures are taking off here. These are the Newark departures, which are just off. If you're at 8,500 feet, they're climbing just off your right wing. The point being, if we can, we will give you your IFR clearance. But oftentimes we can't. And if you have the same hypothetical situation, um, except you need your IFR clearance, there's clouds, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, okay, you're, you know, Consider yourself IFR at this time. Descend and maintain 8,000. Turn left heading 090. I have to contain you in my airspace. I can't just give you to the newer controller without making a phone call, without getting permission. So you're just making a left turn, and you're flying back the direction you came from, but you are IFR now. And then I'll call Newark when I have an opportunity. Or if it's really super busy, I'm going to put you right in this flow. I'll get my, you know, miss you with my LaGuardia arrivals, and I'm going to bring you all the way up here, and I'm going to go direct Sparta as we have um, permission to do in our standard operating procedure at 8,000 feet, I'm going to bring you up here and I'm going to give you direct Sparta from up here and you're going to be in the flow that you should have been in had you just accepted your IFR clearance on the ground. And these are the types of big picture things that you may not um, know. And so I just wanted to paint this picture for you. I don't mind you taking off here and, and asking for your IFR clearance here as long as you are prepared to remain VFR and not get that clearance. The same possible situation is you're on the ground at Westchester, you file this Sparta routing, you're going to Allentown, you say, you know what, I want to fly the Hudson River corridor VFR. Great. And then when I get down to the Verrazano Bridge, I want to call New York and I want to ask to pick up my IFR. You're in you're the same situation. I will try, but there's no guarantee that I can give you this IFR clearance down here going to Solberg. Um, and it's really whether I can or not is one question. And then I have to engage the newer controller who can be very busy. So that's the complexities. There's a reason these routes are built the way they are. Um, and I would suggest if you want to fly an IFR flight, then you fly your IFR flight. And if you want to fly a VFR flight, then do it. And if you're VFR and things change and the weather changes and now you need a pop-up IFR, that's what we do. We'll, we'll bend over backwards for you. But I just want you to have the behind the scenes um, look. And Gene, I didn't start a timer, so please just uh, stop me if I come close to the end of time. But I'm going to move on now to... Um, You're good. Keep going. Great. Um, one of the sort of questions people get a lot is, you know, not wanting to piss off air traffic control. And, and so as a pilot myself, I'm going to show you a video here. It's going to be a short video, and it's essentially a non-event. Nothing happened in this video, which is the way we want all of our flying to be. But I'm flying with my friend Max. He has a YouTube channel. It was Cirrus Max. Now it's Citation Max. Maybe you guys have seen it. But we're, this is video is actually on my channel. And we're arriving. I had just flown down to Virginia. Max flew me down there. And I took a spin recovery class in an extra 300, which I can recommend strongly. Prevalence Aerospace down there in Virginia it was an incredible class. And now we're we had just flown the Hudson River Corridor VFR back, and we're approaching Westchester, and Westchester's gotten very busy. They got departures lined up, a bunch of arrivals. And I'm very conscious, having just taken the spin class of, you know, loss of control and low, low to the ground and people making tight turns to final because, you know, ATC's trying to squeeze them into a gap. Um, so I'm going to let you watch this. And basically, I wasn't – I was running the radios, and Max was very comfortable. He wasn't out of his element, and everything went fine. But I was completely prepared to just say unable um, in this situation. So hopefully this video loads. I'm not sure if you're seeing the video now. 
I mean, no, we are not, not. We are not. And you're not seeing the, uh, video. Okay. Yeah. So, why don't you just um, skip the video yeah. and talk a little bit about the concept of um, saying unable when you're not comfortable? Yeah, I mean, t the 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 controller. This example was um, a, a tight sequence on final, and we've entered a downwind, and the the controller points out the palatus on final and says, "Follow him. You're number two. Clear to land. Go direct the numbers. There's a jet blue on a uh, five mile final, and of course." I asked Max, I said, are you good with this short approach? Because I'll say no. And he said, absolutely. And we landed. But the air traffic controller often, especially when they're busy, they're, they are trying to hit gaps and trying to prioritize efficiency. Not that safety is ever second to efficiency, but we don't know your limitations. Um, and so it's important that you have the confidence to simply say, uh, unable request to extend my downwind, uh, unable request to write 360. And that might piss the controller off, maybe, because he had a gap and he wanted to put you in it and get you on the ground and get you out of his picture. He's got another guy on the downwind behind you. But um, you are the pilot in that situation. And if you can justify that maybe you're task saturated, maybe you're a little behind the airplane, you're just not there. We don't know that right? The tower controller doesn't know that. The approach controller doesn't know that. So you just need to say unable. And if you have a specific request, um, you make it. And um, I think that's just the, the general principle. It, you know, I know that that takes confidence to, 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 to get to that point. But the, the less confidence you have of, as a pilot, the more often you should be willing to say, uh, unable. I'm not taking that short approach, or uh, you know, if, if we could just slow this down a little bit, I'd like to to extend my downwind. And no controller is going to react negatively to that, or if they do, they'll they'll get over it quickly. Um, so I guess we can open it up to questions now. All right. I will change presenters and make me the presenter. There we go. Okay. Yes, we have it. Perfect. Um, we are running over on our time so we're going to have to make this uh, a little bit short um there are quite a few questions here toby would you be open if we um at some time you know in the next few weeks or month we uh, schedule a webinar and you you got so many positive comments here would you be willing to do one just just on absolutely this kind of stuff? yeah yeah all absolutely. right so so we'll do that so i'll um i'll get emails out to everybody that uh when we when we schedule that we'll go from there um it was one I just wanted to share. Somebody said you had so many just positive uh, compliments here, but there was one I wanted to share, and now I'm not seeing it. So I guess we'll just have to move on. All right. Uh, let's see. I do really did want to share that one with you, though. A good one. Well, I lost it. So, <laughs> all right. Oh, well, Toby, excellent presentation. Thank you very much. The ATC thing, you know, to me is something that you could never hear too much about it because there are so many mysteries involved to most pilots. I know it's not a mystery to you, but to many pilots, there are mysteries. So, um, so we, we will get Toby on again. We'll do, uh, we're, I'm going to be doing a series of uh, webinars in the fall here again. And uh, some of these people uh, had such excellent comments coming in that we will definitely uh, invite them to participate again. Again, we appreciate the sponsorship of uh, SAFE on here, and we appreciate uh, David St. George, the Executive Director, participating today. Mid-Island Air Service with two locations, Iswip MacArthur and Brookhaven Airports, full-service FBO providing flight training, Part 61 and 141, rentals, fuel sales, and A&P services. We maintain our school fleet as well as private retail services, including 100-hour 100 100-hour inspections, annuals, pre-buys, as well as stock Cessna and aftermarket parts. Visit us at midislandair.com and facebook.com slash midislandair. And Aircraft Specialty Services is uh, the most trusted name in general aviation when it comes to certifying and repairing major engine components. With quick turnaround times and experienced staff and state-of-the-art machinery, you can trust that your parts are in good hands. Call today. Let us exceed your expectations. And next up, we have Ben Struck. Very pleased to have Ben. He helped me a lot in putting these presentations uh, together today. 
Ben is instructed in Florida, New Jersey, and New York, where he ultimately landed a job at Farmingdale State College, part of the SUNY system, and worked his way up to the ranks to become the chief instructor for their Part 141 program. Ben has flown the Cirrus as a single pilot IFR qualified captain for a Part 135 operator here in the Northeast. Ben joined the FAA in 2012 as an operations inspector at the Farmingdale FISDO, has been an FAA safety team, fast team, program manager since February of 2016. Ben lives in Brooklyn with his wife and two young daughters who keep him busy and always entertained. Uh, ben is going to give us a little bit of a welcome from the safety team today. So Ben, I'm going to hand you the controls. All right. Ben, you have the controls, sir. All right. Thank you much, Gene, and thanks to everybody for uh, for joining us here. Let's see if I got the right thing here. Slow nip. So yeah, uh, my name is Ben. I, I officially represent the Farmingdale FISDO, um, but uh, I'm here to sort of use use all of Northeast uh, as a welcome. So I'm the fast team program manager uh, for the Farmingdale FISDO, which covers from Westchester down th all the way through New York City and then back out east uh, to the end of Montauk uh, and a little bit of, uh, of uh, Fisher's Island there as well. So we, uh, we, we are a busy GA area, um, busy corporate, and obviously with, the, with Toby there, you could see we have a lot of air carrier uh, in and out in, in I think, the busiest airspace in, uh, if not the the world, but certainly the country, uh, or, or or way up there. So, uh, and I appreciate that perspective. And and certainly, you know, should this should uh, we get an opportunity to do some in-person stuff again, uh, it's always great when we get an opportunity to do an operation rain check up in uh, up at the Tracon and uh, and really see it from a controller's perspective uh, in person. But uh, Toby, you did a great job there trying to give us that backstage view. So I'm going to. Uh, turn off my camera here because you don't need to see my my COVID beard anymore and uh, we'll keep going here with a little presentation. So <clears throat> first of all I want to thank Gene um, and let's see if you can all see that screen. Gene did a great job uh, putting this together and we really appreciate his efforts uh, specifically out of the Rochester FISDO but really for for all of GA and he's done a great job and, and I, I've been a subscriber to his Vectors for Safety uh, newsletter for quite some time and I think he does a great job. Thanks also to my management team out of the Farmingdale FISDO for allowing my support here. Thanks to all our volunteer presenters and most importantly to you our general aviation audience. What's the mission of the FAST team? It's to improve the nation's aviation safety record by conveying safety principles and practices through training, outreach, and education, while establishing partnerships and encouraging the continual growth of a positive safety culture within the aviation community. How do we do that? Well, Fast Team Headquarters uh, provides a what we call a national performance plan, a work program basically based on national incident and accident data, and they're they're uh, you know looking looking at what's happening from a global perspective, uh, and then they provide that information back to each office and each district to say these are things that we want you to do to help lower that incident accident rate uh, in general aviation. We take that information as well, and we at the FISDO management level and the FAST team level, we look at our own local data. We may have unique uh, aviation activity in our area. Maybe we have some ag stuff or uh, certainly in New York City, we have helicopter operations. Uh, so we take that information, combine it with the national program uh, to, to come up with risk indicators, and then we figure out ways to try to mitigate that risk through outreach, training, and education. So this mitigation is fluid. New things happen, new entrants into the national airspace system. We're gonna keep working uh, together to, to mitigate that risk and come up with new things, or in this case, new ways of doing things, right? We we had been doing a little bit of go to webinars uh, prior uh, to, to COVID, and now, uh, you know, this is nearly the exclusive way we're doing things, is either go to meeting or Zoom or some other virtual way of getting together. And then we use our industry partners and, and most especially our FAST team representatives, volunteers uh, who are passionate about aviation safety, who want to be uh, to be uh, influential in the area, in the, in the community to try to reduce these, uh, these accident and incident rates. We also have uh, lots of information that we can provide. Um, these days, it's gonna be hard to find a, a print magazine uh, out there on a, on a table in an in-person seminar, but uh, we do have the print version. We have an online digital version. Uh, it's a PDF. I believe there's also ways you can get it onto an e-reader if you're if you're 
you know, used to that kind of thing. Uh, and then what, what they've been doing for quite some time, actually, which is quite nice, when an issue comes out, they'll have another, they'll, they'll have a SPANS uh, announcement and they'll have a virtual event where they're going to talk about in depth some of the articles that come out. Uh, so it's a great, another way to stay engaged with aviation and, and, and sort of add some practices to your, to your uh, aviation tool bag there. Um, we are also, uh, as you can imagine, we're very integrated in the uh, FASafety.gov uh, universe. We have lots of online courses. We have Aviation Maintenance Technician or AMT Awards Program. So I know we're, we're probably mostly pilots here, but we really want to make sure our brothers and sisters in the, in the maintenance side are, are, are working with us as well, because they are, they are key components to our safety culture. Uh, and we have individual awards for AMTs as well as employers. So if they have a you know a number of employees, they can they can earn some some rewards and recognition for being a, a safe uh, organization. We have a general aviation awards program that we participate in: AMT, CFI, Avionics Technician, Fast Team Rep of the Year, etc. And that can all be found at GeneralAviationAwards.com. We also have our prestigious Charles Taylor Master Mechanic Award, as well as Wright Brothers Master Pilot Award, uh, in, in recognition of uh, 50 or more years of uh, safe aviation operations. Uh, and we, we really look forward to the day we can, we can do these in-person uh, recognition ceremonies. I know there's been a, you know, a transition to try to get them virtual, and, and we're doing what we can there. And uh, hopefully, we get a chance to do them more in person uh, in the future. But the bread and butter of what we do is really the WINGS Pilot Proficiency Program. And, and I know, Gene, you explained at the beginning how you get credit. And I just sort of re reiterate here, uh, you know, how important this program is, how, how passionate most of us are about using it, getting people to participate, uh, benefits for everybody who's entering and using it, industry-supported topics, there's plans of action for each flight training phase, uh, airman training based on known industry safety of flight issues, uh, and that's, again, that changes over time. Uh, possible insurance discounts, I can't guarantee it, but uh, especially if you're an aircraft owner, there's, there's usually uh, recognition for your, for your participation in these programs. And then enhanced training available for multiple industry-sponsored in organizations, including, uh, including Genes. Um, now, right at the bottom there, CFIs, don't forget the 10,000, probably need to lead with that, right? $10,000 still active. You know, there's a, a dedicated group of, of industry professionals, supporters, uh, and real believers in this program that they've given uh, $10,000 um, to, to promote the use of this program. So go to mywingsinitiative.org, uh, fill out, complete a phase of wings between uh, the beginning of the year and December 31st, 2020. Please uh, complete the phase, go to that website, enter in your activity, uh, and you get entered into a lottery to win. Uh, you're not going to win 10000 all at once, but uh, it's broken up. I think the highest level is at $1,500, both for you as the airman completing the uh, activity as well as for your instructor. So please, uh, we want you to, to get there. The website, and I know we're going to launch a, a mini poll if we have time, but we've heard your feedback, and David, I appreciate it. He mentioned it as well. Um, we know that the, the website has had some challenges, uh, I'll say delicately, over time, uh, and so in partnership with our industry stakeholders uh, and, and surveys that went out, the website is undergoing a revision process right now to make it easier to use, to simplify the WINGS credit process, uh, so we really are looking forward to that. When we can release it, please stay tuned. COVID-19 relief in your FAA medical. So some people are still having some challenges understanding this, and I just want to make sure that we're clear on it. Um, the SFAR, Special Federal Aviation it's Regulation that came here. out. What's that? <laughs> um, is uh, is uh, SFAR is 118-1 uh, uh, allows for relief from medical certificate privileges if you were set to expire between March 31st and through September 30th, 2020, you're going to get an additional three months of relief. So it's extending that expiration date by three months prior to it going either totally expiring or reverting down to the next uh, next class. It does not modify the requirements of 61.53, which, which is a prohibition on any operation uh, if you have a medical deficiency, a known medical deficiency. Uh, but we still encourage you to accomplish your, your Airman Medical Certificate exam with your AME. Um, AMEs are you know, medical professionals. They understand the risks. They do as much as they can to mitigate it. So most likely it's going to be a, you know, a, a 
relatively socially distant uh, to interview and exam. Uh, I'm sure there's mask wearing and I'm sure there's lots of hand sanitizer involved and it will probably smell very uh, antiseptic um, because it's uh, most likely in a medical facility. But uh, please, uh, you know, they're, they're, if, you're, if you feel comfortable and, and you've had that conversation with your AME, we encourage you to, uh, to get your, your exam completed so that you don't have to worry about the possibility of any future extensions which may or may not exist. Air traffic control hours, please check NOTAMs, check NOTAMs, check NOTAMs. Uh, some air traffic control towers are operating with reduced uh, hours to prevent COVID spread uh, based on staffing levels. Review your advisory circular 90-66 Bravo, uh, non-towered airport flight operations, uh, because you may plan to get to an airport thinking it's going to be a towered airport and you get there and it is not. So we want to make sure you understand what, uh, what you need to do and how to enter uh, and or leave uh, depart an area from a non-towered airport. It's all good practice anyways. Uh, you should know how to do it. Coming up in right now, tentative, and I say it's a firm tentative, uh, is uh, in November is the National Drone Safety Awareness Week. So what this is, is a, a partnership between industry and the FAA to make sure that our recreational drone users, our Part 107 operators, our public aircraft operators, uh, and the communities that they, that they are uh, working in understand uh, and, and get and develop some best practices from a safety culture perspective uh, on how, how these UAS, how these drones are, are in the system and how they uh, are expected to operate, should operate, uh, and some standardized procedures and protocols uh, associated with that. So what it'll be is each day of the week for that week, uh, there's, they're going to focus on different tasks. Right now, our expectation is that it's going to be virtual. Uh, so there'll be go to meetings, there'll be Zooms, there'll be Facebook Lives, and maybe some YouTube streams and all kinds of things. Um, but so if you're interested, uh, certainly check out fasafety.gov. Uh, and, and if you have any interest, uh, certainly reach out to your, your FAST team program manager in your district uh, in participating. I want to give you a little preview of some stuff happening behind the scenes every year uh, for every airport with an operating air traffic control tower, we have what we call a runway safety action team meeting. Uh, and it's really the responsibility of the air traffic control managers to have these meetings, but they involve everybody. They involve the users of that airport. Uh, and so there's a little preview of, of I guess, next year's uh, canned, canned uh, um, uh, PowerPoint presentation, but it's really got some great information that I don't want to wait till we get to the end of next year. Um, so we're going to look at a couple of these things as we move along. First, a little fact here. Please never let an airplane take you somewhere your brain didn't get to five minutes earlier. Speed kills. So we ask that you plan ahead, take your time, and be a stickler for SOPs. Uh, I, I know this was specifically related to a runway safety uh, event, but really that, that philosophy can, can be used in any phase of, of your flying operation. Just knowing the signs and the markings on the airport uh, from a testing perspective is not enough. Right? Runway incursion avoidance is in integral and embedded within the Airman Certification Standards uh, as well as the Advisory Circular 6198. Uh, it's really critical to, to things that you need to do as an airman, uh, both knowledge and skill, to operate uh, effectively and safely on, uh, on the runway or on the airport environment. So know your, know your signage, know your markings, but know your procedures as well. Um, uh, we have an average of three runway incursions uh, a day. So it can happen to you, and it can happen to professional aviators as well. That's why within the Pilot's Handbook of Aeronautical Knowledge, the PHAC, uh, there's a whole section uh, attributed to, to this particular um, you know, to this particular issue. Runway incursions, runway confusion, best practices, et cetera, uh, what causes them especially if you're a single pilot operator. But even if you're, you know, more, you, you fly with more than one person, um, we really encourage you. Advisory Circular 9173 talks about SOPs for single pilot operation taxiing on an airport. Um, please, uh, you know, we can try to minimize or even eliminate a lot of these incidents if you 
train yourself properly and you have uh, and and correctly accomplish standard taxi operating procedures and practices you know minimizing heads down minimizing distractions reviewing the chart prior to taxi having an understanding and expectation of, of where you need to go where you are in the airport where you need to go and what you should expect and then just being vigilant about making sure that the way you the clearance you got is is what you expected or if it's not that you're marking your chart appropriately to to plan that route and then asking for help uh, if you get if you get um, situationally unaware temporarily a lot of us have been well, maybe not at home but certainly not flying as much uh, as we would like uh, and so there's some skills that atrophy over time one of those is th the ability to really understand situational awareness uh, on the runway uh, environment on the airport surface and so there's a great website out there. Uh, it's an FAA website, runwaysafetysimulator.com. It's been around for a while, but they've been they've been developing it and and released some upgrades recently. Um, so it's we have animations where we get to see things that happen in real time, but we also have interactive scenarios for which you can get wings credit. So you you get an opportunity to sort of put your head in into the cockpit and uh, and look at a diagram and, and have an understanding based on air traffic instructions about where you should go and what signage you should see uh, and so it's a great opportunity to get to get that skill back to a relatively proficient level uh, or at least uh, not let it to, not let it to fall into into disuse we've had a great series that's gotten a lot of great feedback as well called from the flight deck um, so that you can see the url down at the bottom from the flight deck um, I'll be honest, probably Google and from the flight deck is probably the easiest way. It'll take you to YouTube channels uh, and YouTube videos. Uh, if you get to the FAA page, you'll see there's a map out there, and the map is basically going to show you all the airports that have one of these videos developed, and as well as the ones that are planning to have a video developed. And what they've done is they've gotten um, uh, you know a light GA aircraft with some I'm assuming but GoPro cameras in the cockpit uh, on the wingtips etc uh, and and really give you a pilot's eye view of I'm about to fly into this airport what are some things I should expect to see what are some hot spots maybe for that airport that are that are concerning to me and that I should be aware of prior to going there um, great diagrams great visuals really has pretty high production value uh, and, and it's gotten a lot of feedback uh, for us here in the Northeast. Uh, we have Bedford in Massachusetts, Long Island MacArthur, Islip out on Long Island. I'm going to say Poughkeepsie, but we say now what, Hudson Valley Regional or something, um, Teterboro and uh, and Philly International. So there's a lot of airports in this area that, that have uh, got good additional information just to sort of supplement your pre-flight planning uh, from these locations. Um, really. This is uh, this is uh, an opportunity for for you to be reminded that safety is our mission, right? And you're the reason uh, we want you to re to come back safe. We want you to have every uh, every flight you take uh, an uneventful one, as as Toby said. Um, take 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 away really is be an ambassador, not just for runway safety, because I didn't want to modify this slide, but for for aviation safety in general. Share these essentials with a stick buddy, uh, with you know organizations and groups that you you fly with, uh, and Safety is no accident, so we want you to be intentional uh, in, in everything you do to, to maintain that safety. Here's a little quick takeaway from a, uh, an event that happened about a month ago. Um, pilot flying from Westchester out to Montauk, coming over the, uh, the dune, approaching runway 24, uh, and frankly got, got a little caught unaware of a crosswind uh, operation uh, and lost directional control on, on landing. Uh, and had what we call a runway excursion, where they've left the, uh, the you know the, the paved surface where we expected them to be. Luckily, nobody got hurt. Um, pilot has a bit of a bruised uh, pride and ego right now, and the aircraft is substantially damaged, uh, and, it, and it did get classified as an accident. Uh, but just showing it can happen anytime, anywhere. Uh, so please, we need you to be vigilant um, and uh, you know try to maintain that safety culture 100% uh, of the time. Um, Leave you here with a quote from uh, from Wilbur Wright. In flying, I have learned that carelessness and overconfidence are usually far more dangerous than deliberately accepted risks. So please, we don't want you out there being careless or overconfident. Um, if we can if we can accept risks uh, that we know about, I think we're we're going to be safe aviators, and that's what we really want.
Uh, if you have questions for me uh, at the end of this seminar, either filter them through Gene, certainly, uh, or I'm happy to, to accept and be the conduit uh, to get you back out to, to the FAST team program manager in your district. Um, they should be a great resource, as well as the FAST team um, representatives and lead representatives in your, in your district in terms of uh, promoting safety, promoting safety culture, uh, getting involved with the FAST team, et cetera. But if you have any questions, I'd be happy to, to do what I can and funnel it as necessary. Um, and then that's it. Thank you. Uh, thank you from the FAST team. And uh, I appreciate uh, Gene's uh, willingness to let me speak here. Hey, Ben, thank you very much. That was great. We really appreciate no it. And I'm taking the controls back here and we have it. No um, there was a little bit of an internet burp in the middle of that, but it was only for a few seconds. Okay. I got a, I got a notice that uh, my internet was down and I looked over and my uh, cable modem was all dark. And it said, webinar will end if it's not restored in 60 seconds. But in about 10 seconds later, it came back up. So, um, so my blood pressure is a little high now. Don't want to go for a flight physical. We'll, uh, we'll leave that to a little bit later. All right, Ben, we, we really appreciate it. And we have a couple of polls coming up here that Ben submitted. We'll get to those after a quick word from our sponsor. Westchester Aviation Association is your voice at the Westchester County Airport. We're an enthusiastic group of aviation professionals. Please join us at Westchester Aviation dot org and we'll launch a poll hopefully there we go launch we're not going to spend long on this one maybe 30 seconds at max so go ahead and put in your answer for that one for those that are active wings program participants how satisfied are you with this wings program ease of use and I and I, I realize I put the cart before the horse there, but that's okay. Uh, you know, we we like we said, I think we've seen and heard feedback. It, it's mostly good, but we want to make it better. We really want people to to feel feel the ease of use with this program. Oh, that's fine. That's fine. We'll see there. People are coming in. We have sixty six percent, sixty seven percent. We're going to close the poll in. Yeah, there's seventy percent. We're going to close the poll in five, four, three, two, one. Oh, is closed, and we will share the results. Well, you did pretty good there. Yeah, that's pretty about good what I expect. That. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And there's a new uh, new website coming out, so that should uh, that should look good. And uh, I think the other poll is yes. We'll launch this one. This one is from Ben. Also. When we emerge from COVID, which format of educational outreach do you, th do you think you'd prefer? This is important. I'm anxious to see the results of this one also. I, as am I. I mean, I'm, I've been really enjoying these. I've, I've seen uh, the humanity. I've been able to connect with people, and hopefully they get that, uh, you know, that feeling as well. Um, I know we're all anxious. I'd love to be sitting in a hangar having stale coffee and stale donuts, but uh, <laughs> uh, I'm, really, I'm, re I'm really enjoying and I think we've been able to get, get safety messages out and continue continue these discussions quite well using this virtual technology. Yeah, to me the, uh, the, the live in-person ones are just so much fun because you get to meet so many people and shake hands or I guess fist bump is the most we could ever hope for in the future, but whatever it is. <laughs> so, okay. We have 73% voted on this one, so we'll close the poll in five Four, three, two, one, closed, share. Um, live, live virtual virtual. webinars won. I'm a little bit surprised, but of course the, we can reach so many more people okay. with the virtual webinars and we can with yeah. the webinars, but, but both of those are uh, pretty good. I'm glad that not yes. a lot of people prefer the pre-recorded webinars because I hate to do them, but anyway, that's, <laughs> that's personal opinion. All right, we will, we will hide that. And we will we will move on. Thank you very much, uh, Ben. I'm going thank to you, Gene. what do I have coming up here? Um, uh, we want to thank our sponsor, PilotToPilot.com, for their support of this event. Pilots, you can reduce your cost of flying. Fly with another pilot. Post your flights. View posted flights in your area by joining PilotToPilot.com. That's the number two in there, as you can you can see. Good organization. Uh, the Westchester Aviation Association, that's your voice at Westchester County Airport. Enthusiastic group of aviation professionals. Join us at westchesteraviation.org. And um, new parts, engine overhaul, general aviation is our specialty. Aircraft Specialty Services has been the most trusted name in general aviation for over 40 years. 
We have everything you need under one roof. Call our knowledgeable and friendly sales staff today and let us exceed your expectations. Phone numbers and so on are on their site, aircraftspecialties.arrow. And next up, we're running a little late, Kirk, sorry, but you have all the time time you need, no problem. Uh, next is uh, Kirk Thorvaldson. Kirk has more than 40 years of flying experience. His career includes being a U.S. Air Force pilot and Delta Airlines captain. His job responsibilities are um, recruiting, engaging, and, and re-engaging pilots for the operation. Um, I, I think I left something out here that he's uh, presently the uh, pilot coordinator for Patient Air Services, PALS. His job responsibilities are recruiting, engaging, and re-engaging pilots for the operation, processing applications, collecting the required paperwork, and certifying the pilots to fly with PALS, as well as working them in outreach programs to patients, veterans, and pilots. Kirk's presentation is Patient Airlift Services, Flying Patients to Medical Treatment with Safety as our first priority. And I'm going to uh, give Kirk the controls here. And there we go. Kirk, you have the controls. We're seeing you. We're seeing your screen. We're not hearing you. Can you hear me now? We are. Sounds like okay. a telephone commercial can you hear me now yes you're up. <laughs> <laughs> that's right that's right well I, I i will say in the last poll which i didn't get to do uh the virtual is really good it's uh in person is always nice but the, these virtual uh, seminars are working very well so it's it's a nice way to do things so um i appreciate you being being me being here today uh watching the previous uh talks uh, they're very valuable and and i hope i uh, have something valuable to say to uh, everyone who's listening and uh, i appreciate being invited to do this seminar today um and i'd like to go ahead and uh, present my uh, powerpoint just need to run the presentation. Almost there. We're getting all your slides across the bottom still. Okay. One second. And there. Bingo. We're Quick good. for takeoff. All right. Thank you very much. And uh, I did this this morning. It didn't go smooth. Hopefully it goes smooth today. Um, uh, I want to uh, talk a little bit about myself. I um, have a flying career of six years in the Air Force, flying transport, uh, 24 years with Delta Airlines, uh, flying uh, seven types of aircraft. And the uh, talk by Toby earlier was very valuable, like LaGuardia. I actually learned a lot. Um, I did work for five years at a charter company out of Islip MacArthur. I didn't fly, but uh, one of my uh, responsibilities there was working with young charter captains all of 24, 25 years old, I call them babies, but uh, good pilots, but the world around a pilot uh, is huge, and part of my job was uh, imparting some of my ancient wisdom up to them and talking about it. And I, in that job, I learned a lot about smaller aircraft because we had three twin props and about all the smaller airports that uh, general aviation pilots fly into. So I learned a lot and I got educated, and it was, uh, it was a good place to learn. Uh, about uh, the charter world. Uh, my primary position at uh, PALS as a pilot coordinator. Um, I uh, am there to uh, recruit and engage and re-engage uh, pilots out, out in the world, general aviation pilots who want to work with PALS. Um, and, in, and in that, uh, I'm the person who handles the application. So uh, the biggest part of that is ensuring that the currency, flight time, et cetera, of the pilots are up to date and uh, meet the standards of PALS, uh, which we'll get into a little bit later. Uh, that's an important part. I also am the go-to person when a pilot calls with a question, especially a new pilot, like one who called the other day, first time into Logan, and he had some questions for me about approaching and taxiing and all at Logan, which uh, thankfully with Delta I had a lot of experience. So. Um, uh, I was asked uh, about 16 months ago to come join PALS because of my pilot experience and help with uh, pilot recruitment and uh, engagement. And uh, I've enjoyed it. I work two days a week, but I'm on my emails every day, and I feel like I am giving back uh, with the 
job I do, um, although I don't do as much certainly as the pilots do. So we're going to talk a little bit about PALS and then get into requirements. Uh, Patient Airless Services is a nonprofit uh, that offers free air transportation based on need. Need being uh, cannot afford to fly a distance for medical treatment or because of their illness uh, and their health is compromised, they cannot fly on a, a commercial flight around a lot of people. Um, these are people requiring diagnosis, treatment, or follow-up care. We work with our uh, military vets, uh, wounded vets and their families, and then we do a humanitarian uh, airlift. Uh, for instance, uh, we're on standby to help at the after the hurricane they had in Texas and Louisiana last week. So um, those are our uh, areas that we help people with. Now, how does PALS work? Uh, a group of dedicated volunteer pilots who provide this service, and, and they're passionate about it enough to donate their time and their aircraft to help out our vets and our uh, patients. Uh, we have over 1,500 pilots signed up with PALS. We have over 560 command pilots. Uh, left seaters, and then we have over 260 mission assistants who are our right seaters. Uh, very passionate about what they do. Uh, the best calls I get after a pilot does his first flight, he can't wait to do a second one after seeing how he can help people in need. Uh, we have a small staff at uh, PALS. Our mission coordinators, uh, four of them, do a great job of, of trying to provide a flight for the uh, number of people who do apply for a for a trip and and i will tell you throughout the country all the organizations like ours there are not enough pilots to handle every request we get but we do the best we can um, we have uh people who raise uh funds for sustainability it's a nonprofit. we depend on it fundraising is hard uh, this year but um uh, we're working at it uh, and we have outreach people to not only reach out to pilots but to reach out to patients who don't know what we offer and medical facilities of all sorts who don't know what we offer. Our board of directors all volunteer, most of them fly airplanes, um, and they fly missions for PALS. So they understand what the patients need, and then they can give the pilots what they need to get the uh, mission done. Uh, one of our pilots on the board has actually 2,000 missions with PALS in the last 10 years since we been around. So uh, very dedicated, very passionate, and they're here to help the pilots. Where does PALS fly? Uh, we are primarily east of the Mississippi in the northeast part of the country. I would say the bulk of our flying is from Virginia through Maine. We, last year we started a big push through uh, Ohio into Indiana, Illinois, uh, Michigan. And the goal is to offer our patients and our vets uh, the chance to go to the best facility that can cure their illness. And uh, so the more places we can fly into, the better. And people go, why, why leave Boston to go somewhere for a hospital? The best hospital is not always in Boston or New York or Philadelphia. It's somewhere else. So we're trying to offer them uh, a chance to get cured. Um, our typical flight, uh, we use the general aviation aircraft. Almost all of them are single engine four to six seaters. We do have some larger aircraft. Uh, we fly trips from two to three hours per leg. Could be shorter, one hour. Uh, 200, 600 miles, depending on the aircraft. If we have longer flights or we fly out of our area and uh, work with another organization like ours, we have linking flights where a pilot will fly one leg, hand the patient over to another pilot, and then we'll uh, continue the mission to its end. Uh, what types of missions? As I stated briefly earlier, uh, the bulk of our missions are normal missions or people going to from medical care or consultation. Um, we do do compassion flights where we'll give free flights to family members who have a loved one in a hospital distance away, and we will fly them to visit their uh, uh, loved ones uh, in the hospital. Or if they have someone in the last stages of life, we'll give them free flights to uh, visit them. Uh, we work a lot with military personnel, with the VA hospitals, um, and then personally uh, with them and their families, uh, getting them to uh, 
do treatment. And also we have camps that we send uh, uh, vets to, that we give them transportation to with their families where they can bond and uh, as a family uh, do some physical and, and mental rehabilation. Uh, Pals for Pilots is part of that program, the Major League Baseball. Unfortunately, this year it's not working so well, but Major League Baseball gives us tickets. For instance, last year we flew up to Cleveland uh, for the All-Star Game. We flew uh, veterans from the Virginia area up. They got to stay overnight. They got to go to the game. We got them on the field to meet the players and the commissioner, and they had a great time. And the personal stories that come out of that about how great it is for their rehabilitation is very heartwarming, and it's a very popular program. And again, uh, humanitarian aid, um, Puerto Rico in 2017, we flew over 500 missions into Puerto Rico. And uh, even though they're smaller airplanes, if you can fly equipment and medical supplies in and then take out a person who needs to get to a hospital, it, it works very well. We've done help in the Mississippi Valley with flooding. Um, and again, we're uh, on standby for uh, Texas, Louisiana, if they need our help at all. What are requirements for a PALS flight? And, and this does get into is, is safety issues. Um, the mission coordinators do a background check, uh, medical, financial, and a personal. Um, the medical, we want to make sure that they are able to fly on an airplane and, and take a flight. And to that end, they must be medically stable, ambulatory, uh, ability to enter an aircraft with limited assistance. We do have passengers who need uh, steps. And in our pilot community where we list our flights available, uh, all this information is listed so the uh, command pilot can look at it and, and decide if his aircraft uh, is capable of doing the mission and taking care of this person. Uh, they do need a doctor's release uh, to fly with us in a uh, non-pressurized general aviation aircraft. Uh, they must not have a contagious or communicable disease. Um, and we do uh, a personal background check just to make sure that when this person is on your aircraft, they're going to be safe for you to have uh, sitting behind you during the flight. Um, the mission coordinators have gotten very good at asking questions, deciphering answers, and, ma and making sure that the, uh, the passengers, when they're approved, will be okay on your aircraft. Uh, for the flight request, uh, once they verify the need, they get a medical clearance. Uh, the mission coordinators organize the logistics. They publish uh, the city pairs, uh, the dates, the times, uh, which are always flexible uh, for the pilots to fit in their schedule. Um, they handle airport paperwork. We get fees waived at FBOs for uh, various fees that they will charge, and also we work with them at discounts for fuels. Um, pilots view these requests and make sure that they can handle the flight, uh, and there is always special needs consideration. Uh, during the COVID uh, uh, pandemic, we spent a lot of time, we shut down for three months, we spent a lot of time coming up with a protocols and uh, with help of medical people. And we did uh, a very good job of coming up with protocols. And I check back with pilots after they do flights. And, and the feedback has been very, very positive. Everybody feels safe, both the passengers and the pilots. Um, once a pilot gets a tr trip, he is in charge. Uh, he is responsible for coordinating with the patient, uh, where to meet, what airport. The airports can be flexible. If you don't want to fly into Logan because you haven't done it or it's a bad time of day to fly into Logan, um, you can change airport. You can ask to change airports. And people use Norwood or Bedford. Uh, same thing with Philadelphia. Uh, we don't, we try not to fly into LaGuardia or Kennedy uh, because they uh, can be a mess. And I say that politely, uh, but from experience with Delta Airlines. Um, they will speak to the passengers, ask them questions, uh, answer questions uh, about general aviation flying since it's a lot different than the airlines and, and sort of allay some uh, fears they may have about getting a small airplane. Um, they talk about their flying experience. They talk about the airports, flying time, weather. 
but once I get the mission, they're in charge. So if they want to change an airport, they would like to change a departure time, maybe slide it one way or the, another, as long as it fits in the uh, appointment time for the patient, uh, that's up to them, as long as they uh, notify the mission coordinators. Um, and part of that uh, is um, the, the, uh, the logistics of it is, uh, is big concern is weight and balance. These are small aircraft. Uh, we have situations where someone wants to take three people and we have to ask them to leave one person behind. Um, as far as uh, baggage, uh, we are limited to 20 pound uh, overnight bags, soft sided so they can be stored easily. If there is a wheelchair or a stroller, they have to be foldable. We get the weights and dimensions. Same thing with a car seat. Any extra equipment they may be may uh, bring along, such as uh, oxygen bottles. All that information is listed in our pilot community, so the pilots can make an educated decision as far as uh, whether they're able to do this flight and do it safely. Our pilots. Uh, I mentioned earlier we have over 1,500 pilots who have applied, uh, more than 560 uh, with a desire to help. Uh, and, and here is my probably most important part of the application process is ensuring our pilots are qualified both with the FAA and with the PALS limitations. And these are PALS uh, requirements. Um, they will need to submit copies of license, medical, uh, last few pages of logbook, latest BFR IPC, uh, insurance on their aircraft up to our standards. Uh, I will look everything over. Uh, for single engine aircraft, you need 350 total hours with 50 hours PIC in the make and model of aircraft. Uh, for a twin engine, you need 500 total hours, no less than 400 hours PIC time. And again, 50 hours uh, in make and model. You need to have flown 50 hours as PIC in the last calendar month. 12 calendar months. And I know this year it's been uh, difficult for some people to maintain the hours with uh, COVID and uh, shutting down uh, the flying. Um, and I will say that um, people once in a while ask for a waiver and a time. We, we do not grant waivers. We're in this for safety. We've had a good record in our 10 years of existence. We want to keep it that way. So uh, we do require uh, these uh, requirements. Uh, flown a minimum of 12 hours of PIC in, in the 90 days immediately following uh, preceding the mission. And again, we want pilots who are flying uh, continuously. Um, so when it comes to the mission, they're up to speed on uh, flying their aircraft. They have to be instrument rated and current, uh, current BFR and IPC, access to an aircraft. People, most of them own the aircraft. They can rent and borrow an aircraft as long as they can uh, show the uh, insurance requirements are met on those aircraft that are rented or borrowed. Um, and then under 78 years of age. Um, we sometimes some people want to fly longer for PALS, but uh, we have to set a limit, so we set it at 78. Uh, our mission assistants or co-pilots are uh, people who don't meet these requirements. Uh, and, uh, they need to submit a copy of their license, medical logbook. Once I verify all that, I make them an official mission assistant. And they can fly along with a command pilot if a command pilot wants someone with him. Um, we have a uh, flight Sunday. Uh, the person actually owns a jet flying for her pals, and um, his normal person flies with him wasn't able to, so we got a mission assistant out of Pennsylvania who's going to fly with him and get some experience on, on, on the airplane and also see what a pals mission looks like. Pals mission expectations. Uh, baggage, mail equipment, weight and details are verified. Uh, they're, uh, we try to keep them accurate. Um, and the passengers are normally very good about doing it. We have had instances where uh, we've had to leave baggage behind or a person behind, but uh, we stress safety. We're not going to do anything that will uh, stretch the limits of the aircraft or the pilot. Uh, as I said, strollers, wheelchairs, collapsible, oxygen, FAA approved, 
Children younger than two or less than 40 pounds must travel in an FAA-approved seat and may not be held by the parent. Um, go no-go decisions are the sole responsibility of pilot command. Uh, whatever a pilot decides to do with a mission, if he has to delay it or cancel it, um, PALS will back him up and will go along with his decision. All right. Uh, would like to think that every pilot out there has uh, uh, limits uh, for what they will do and uh, have their minimums. And um, there is no problem with canceling a flight if you don't feel comfortable with the weather uh, or any other situation. And it happens in the winter. It happens this summer with thunderstorms. But the good thing is our passengers are required to have a backup option, option to travel in an event of a cancellation, um, whether it be by someone driving them or we've had take, people take buses or trains or get to their destination, and PALS uh, will work with them to make sure they get to where they're going. This takes some of the uh, load off the pilots uh, having to do the mission and get it completed. He will know that uh, we will get uh, the person there safely. Um, and then there is some uh, mission reporting and documentation after the trip, which will, uh, you know, aid us in our uh, future operations. Uh, another uh, aspect of this, uh, where we have some additional requirements from the FAA, um, pilots that donate their time and talent, um, and uh, we are a tax exempt charity, and direct mission costs can be uh, deducted as a charitable contribution. Uh, to aid organization like us and the pilots that work for us or fly for us, uh, 2011, the FAA granted PALS, uh, allowing pilots to be reimbursed for fuel costs while conducting a flight with a passenger on board, since Part 91 pilots can't be paid. Um, the exemption did come with some FAA-imposed requirements of pilots, uh, just trying to keep a safe operation as possible. For this program, the pilots must hold a second-class medical. They must have 500 hours, uh, no less than 400 PIC, uh, and make a model. And they have to have their IPC uh, every 12 months. Um, there are two online courses to take. Uh, one is a public benefit flying course. The other course talks about uh, yeah, all the aspects of flying an airplane, including weight and balance and such. There is uh, some paperwork to handle in before the flight uh, departs. Uh, again, safety issues. Uh, you have to sh hand in your a copy of your weight and balance. Um, we have a pre-flight risk assessment tool, which actually is a very good tool for any pilot flying any time to, to look over. It looks at four areas, airports, operations, runways, and weather. It's a point system. You add up points. If it gets to a certain amount, the pilot has to contact the uh, PALS uh, safety committee and talk about whether the flight should be done. And uh, that has to be filled out and handed in. And then the last thing is uh, we have uh, a affirmation certificate which covers a, a number of areas, um, showing that the pilot has done the proper, taken the proper steps to ensure a safe flight. Um, they look at uh, flight requirements such as uh, flight planning, weather, uh, additions to takeoff minimums and landing minimums for the flight, uh, ensuring that the aircraft has been maintained properly uh, and inspected. Uh, Passenger briefing uh, has been done. Uh, flight, they look at flight duty uh, regulations, rest time, flight time limits. So uh, again, it's an affirmation that all this has been done, that their certificates and currency experience are current, and then they can do the flight. So again, it's, a, it's a all safety related, and it uh, helps uh, PALS to continue our good record of having uh, safe, safe flights. Um, how does PALS make a difference? Uh, by making it possible for patients to get to the right hospital. As I said earlier, it's not always a local hospital, not one close by they can just drive to. It can be far away, and we want to offer our patients the best 
possible uh, facilities to cure uh, the illness that they have. Uh, we provide hope and possibility of a better life to everyone we fly. We help keep healthcare in reach uh, by uh, offering a chance to go long distance. We keep families together during the crisis with our uh, uh, flying them to, to be with their families, and we uh, do the trips for our wounded military and their families. Um, we do have a, a virtual uh, a gala event uh, this year to help raise funds if you're interested uh, in helping out pals uh, beyond flying. And uh, here's the information at the end that you can use to contact pals. Um, and uh, also for me, you may email me at any time to get any more information. And that's the end of my presentation. All right, Kirk, thank you very much. I'll take the controls back here if I can find myself on the list. And <laughs> there we go. Uh, okay. Thank you, Kirk. That was great. I was glad you uh, put that in the end for the for the donations. We all know how much it costs to operate aircraft. And, um, yep. you know, any anything you can do to help uh, PELS. I know that in speaking with them, they had a number of fundraisers that were canceled this year yes. because of the because of covid okay. so um, it is an important service that they do um, it's valuable i don't think anybody can can argue with that how can you argue with that you know it's a it's a great thing so uh, so if you can donate and help them out that would be great we appreciate it all right thank you kirk that was uh, that was terrific all right we'll uh if you can turn your I'll turn Kirk's camera off there. Uh, okay, in case you didn't know, Vemco is a sponsor of the FAST team and pays for the wings that we receive when we complete a phase of wings. And, of course, we all want to be completing those phases of wings, so we appreciate that, Vemco. And um, pilottopilot.com, one of our sponsors, we thank them for their support of this event. Pilots can reduce the cost of flying. It, uh, it's pretty simple. Just fly with another pilot, and you can learn quite a bit by doing that as well. Post your flights. View posted flights in your area by joining pilottopilot.com. New York Jet at Icewood MacArthur Airport, through its operating company Mid-Island Air Service, sets the standard for total FBO service with our professional and personal services offering full concierge needs from catering, hotel, and car rentals to corporate, business, and private pilots. You can uh, visit them at uh, newyorkjet.com. And, and there you go, the slides. Um, always wanted to learn to fly? Avia Flight Academy, your ultimate flight school in Connecticut, offering all pilot ratings, first flight experiences, Young Aviator Academy for Teens, that's something they also run. Dream big with us and learn to fly in a safe and fun environment using the latest digital technology to enhance your learning experiences. And visit us at aviaflightacademy.com. All right. Well, <laughs> the um, my presentation today, I, I was the buffer in the end here. Let me uh, see if I can turn my webcam on for a moment here. If I can find it. There we go. And it should be up. You should see my smiling face momentarily. Maybe. There it is. Okay. Um, my presentation uh, was titled, uh, Sometimes It's the Little Things, but I, ha I know how these things tend to run lost, long. And my presentation was um, specifically designed to be short or long, depending. I'm talking about little things that are like uh, doors unlatched, seats unlatched, oil caps left on the wing, you know, things like that. Um, and I have a lot of examples in there, but I'm not going to start that because of the time that we... Um, you know, that we have today. So I think I will either run that as a separate webinar at some other time, or I will put it up as a YouTube video. If you, um, if you go to vectorsforsafety.com, no letters, just V-E-C-T-O-R-S-F-O-R-S-A-F-E-T-Y.com, uh, that's a website that I operate for my safety initiative. And from on there, you can sign up to be on the mailing list to receive Vectors for Safety. It's a free publication. There's no advertising, no pop-up ads. It's just there. Um, sign up for that, and then you'll be notified of all these kinds of upcoming events. So um, please go ahead and do that. So for closing remarks, I just want to say a few words in closing. Thanks to all our attendees. Um, 
you know, you gave up your morning, uh, and at least here in the northeast where I am, it's a very nice uh, early fall morning, so we appreciate that. Of course, we give thanks to our presenters for their time and for sharing their expertise. We also want to thank our sponsors, without whom such events as these would not be possible. Our attendees, our presenters, and our sponsors have all demonstrated a commitment to aviation safety. Remember that if you indicated you wanted to receive WINGS credit for your participation today when you registered, uh, please give me a week to sort that out. There's a lot of uh, sorting has to happen, and then it's, so it's just a little bit of a cumbersome process. Not uh, not too bad, but um, I'm going to take the rest of the weekend off here, and I'll get started on that stuff on Monday. So uh, give me a week to do that. So with that, I'll say thank you for attending, and please always remember to fly like your life depends on it. I'm Gene Benson, and I'm putting in the chops for now. Bye-bye.